online. That, and we should have close to 100 in the room. So you let me know. A commercial? Oh, yeah, okay. If, if you want to connect to the Wi-Fi, <laughs> now it's not so you can check your emails or to, you know, check with your family at home or whatever. This is, we, we have some questions on Menti that we'll be asking. If you log in, then you'll be able to connect to Menti more quickly. All right. Okay. And you can turn off your phones. Great. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my great pleasure to have all of you here. Uh, I'm John Schneider. I'm the Secretary General of the GEM Foundation. And uh, I'm here to introduce our conference. Are we making a difference? For those of you, actually, some of you actually in this room are in this photograph. This is from Gem was actually founded in 2009 officially um, as a as a foundation, nonprofit foundation in Pavia, Italy, and uh, with a vision of a world resilient to earthquakes. I'd say we've done quite a bit, but we uh, we have a ways to go. But today we'll have a chance to see exactly where where we are in that in that process. I'd like to thank especially our supporters, uh, which is a growing number now. We have quite a number of, uh, of sponsors, public governors, private governors, advisor sponsors, associates, and now as well product distribute product dis, uh, distribution partners. So we have a, quite a quite a, a complement of of uh, supporters, collaborators, all working together with us. Our collaboration framework is built on partnerships. We have a multi-level approach. We try to link local to global by bringing uh, people together, uh, experts in their, in their location, in their region, bring methodologies from, from uh, global uh, best practice, and to bring all of that together into our collaboration. So collaboration is one of our key principles. Also, scientific credibility, openness, and public good. And these are things that we genuinely practice every day. And every project, every collaboration, we, hold, we try to hold to those, to those principles. <clears throat> we haven't had a forum like this since 2018. Now, we had COVID in the way. Um, or we per perhaps would have done one or two in between. But in 2018 was the first release of our, uh, was the release of our first global hazard and risk models. That was held in, in uh, Pavia, in the, uh, in the church adjacent to uh, uh, Carr College. Uh, there was quite an event and uh, it's now almost five years, but we're going to have a, a launch of the second generation maps and models today. Now, for the, I'll just give you a brief overview of what we're up to. So, uh, we will, following me, there'll be an opening address by video uh, from Mami Mitsutori, who's the uh, special representative to the UN Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction. And then we will have uh, uh, presentations on the, on the recent earthquakes in uh, Turkey. Uh, Ian Stewart will have a break. And then we will have um, our first uh, technical, or well, our, our, what we're calling session one is uh, is about what has been developed. So we'll go, we'll look back, uh, we'll look over over time to what we have been been developing. We'll present the new hazard and risk models and maps. Uh, Sonia Tawar will will um, chair that session, and then we'll have an aperitivo at eighteen hundred. 
and all of you are most welcome to attend that. Uh, tomorrow then we'll have a session two, how has it been used? So we'll focus in that session on risk assessments and their impact. We have a number of collaborators here today who will present uh, work that they've been doing uh, in collaboration with us and or using our uh, tools and, and models and data moderated by Jorg Stephenson. Uh, we'll have lunch and more posters and then the Final session, where are we going? We'll look into the future of seismic risk assessment uh, towards global resilience. If we uh, can still try to still try to, uh, Lindsay Davis will moderate that session and that'll be the wrap. So uh, without uh, further ado, then I'd like to uh, ask Andres to roll the, the video. Actually, I forgot something, didn't I? I forgot the questions. Do I still have time? Okay, let's do one. He was looking at me like I forgot something. So we have, if you, if you uh, are connected to Wi-Fi, you can log into Menti. You can either type this into your browser or you can uh, use your QR scanner and scan the, scan the code. And then once you've done that, give people a minute or maybe 10 seconds. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, maybe we'll go to the, uh, so we've, with a uh, hundred of you in the room and, and uh, several hundred online, we thought it'd be nice to know where you're all from. And uh, we, know, we know from the, from the registrations that we've got a pretty wide dispersed um, group of people. Wow, London is tops. Germany is a close second. Of he is a close third. You're getting dizzy? London still tops. Okay. Okay. That's is that good? Yeah. I, yeah, we have a minute. Let's try try one more. We like to gather a little bit of intelligence. So if you can answer this question, what interests you most about this conference? And I think you're allowed to say everything, including the drink. Plans for the future. running close, neck and neck between uh, plants, model updates, and uh, future plans. Yeah, you guys are, <laughs> it says just here for the drinks, now to be fair. Hopefully, and of course the people online, maybe everyone here actually put that. It's the online audiences uh, since they don't have access to the drinks, okay. So now perhaps you can roll the, okay, we'll start with this and then we'll get on with the technical. Dear General Schneider, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, while I regret I could not join you in person, I am delighted to be able to send you this message for the opening of the Global Earthquake Model Conference 2023. I thank the GEM Foundation and its sponsors for organizing this conference and for devoting this first session to the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. As one of the deadliest disasters to impact this region, we stand in solidarity with all those who were affected and continue to call on countries to support the recovery and reconstruction efforts so that communities can build back better. 
we also owe it to the victims to ensure that such disasters do not happen again. Indeed, soon after the disaster, I heard from government counterparts, including from countries that are not traditionally earthquake prone, wondering if their cities could survive a similar earthquake. This is what makes GEM and its work so important to reducing the risk of earthquake disasters. Countries must invest in building a solid understanding of their risks, especially who and what are most vulnerable. This was one of the key recommendations that emerged from last month's high-level meeting of the UN General Assembly on the midterm review of the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. But building risk knowledge is not easy for many developing countries, which is why we value our partnership with Shen and why we welcome today's launch of the new global earthquake hazard and risk maps, models, and database. These tools will be invaluable in supporting risk-informed decision-making, including improving building code and construction, land use planning, and facilitating access to insurance. I'm grateful to the GEM Foundation for your contribution, and I ask all the conference's participants to think of how to best support the most vulnerable countries, identify and manage risks before they become disasters. Thank you. Are you starting it over? <laughs> okay. All right. That was uh, that was actually a very good opening for us. So um, thank you. Thank you, Mami Mitsutori. Uh, I'd like to introduce Ian Stewart. Ian Stewart, professor in many places, including the UK and Jordan. I never know where he's going to be. Uh, but it's a pleasure to have you here to introduce the uh, the next speakers on the on the Turkey earthquake. Um, please take the uh, take the stage. Thanks. Nice, nice when moderators get a round of applause. Well, it's like I haven't done anything yet. Thank you, everyone, uh, for uh, for coming along. Mm? Oh, for you, that was for you. Sorry, it's just delayed for John that applause. So yeah, so this is the first session. So the idea really with this was, um, you know, in order to throw us into the fray of trying to think about earthquakes, what Jem's role is, you know, the, the role of data, the role of information, and, the, and to confront the reality of what we're all dealing with, which we all, we all in this room know all too well. But the, the event, the, the 6th of February event uh, earlier this year in Turkey, Turkey or Syria was, was one of those events where I think he, you you can remember where you were when you first heard about it. It was a, you know, we get so used to hearing of earthquakes, especially in our line of work. But this is one that I think it surprised a lot of us. Um, particularly, I guess, those that have been working in the region have been fixated for so long on Istanbul, thinking about this big threat to this mega city. And yet here's this huge event that comes in, a, in an area of the world where lots and lots of cities and we, and we see, you know, very similar devastation and you kind of think, you know, same old, same old. And so it really starts to make, think about the justifications of what it is we're doing when these kind of events can still uh, happen. So the idea was to have a, a focus really on, on that event, get the latest uh, thinking about that, and that will propel us into the first sessions. So we're going to have two talks introducing different aspects of that. The talks will be about half an hour or so. We can have some questions, and then uh, we'll throw into the, the panel session after that. So in terms of the, um, uh, the first talk, first talk is from Sinan Akar. Sinan is a professor at Boazici uh, University in, uh, in Istanbul and also the principal catastrophe modeler at Turk Reinsurance. Got uh, 20, over 20 years of experience in earthquake engineering, specialized in ground motion modeling and critical uh, for a critical infrastructure and probabilistic risk for insurance and reinsurance. So if Sinan can come to the stage, and he's going to talk about a uh, keynote uh, lessons from the 2023 magnitude 7.7 Karaman Maras Gaziantep uh, Turkey earthquake. So thank you.
Thank you very much once again. And it's a real pleasure for me to be with you, recalling everything back in like 15 years. I have been in Pavia for teaching for three times, many times attending the project meetings. It's a different, I mean, it's not so uh, foreign to me. It's not something quite different. I feel like I'm here in, at home, really. Thank you very much, Vitor, to initiate this invitation. And thank you very much for the organization, John, for organizing the whole thing. So what I'm going to present here is actually, as a group, we have learned from the 2023 Kahramanmaraş Turkey earthquakes. And I'm going to talk about the modeling aspects of insured portfolio losses. As part of the team in TRAP, not anymore in <laughs> Turk reinsurance, TRAP is a subsidiary company of a technology company of uh, Turk reinsurance now. It's not a big deal, by the way. Uh, we worked a, a lot on this. Uh, am I going to do that? To change the... Ah. Okay. And the laser pointer is... Okay. Okay, so I'm going to give you the overview of Kahraman Mara shortquakes firstly, and then main loss modeling components explored for TCIP insured portfolio losses. I'm going to focus on TCIP, the so-called DASK, also in Turkish. And I'm gonna give you case studies and observations we made during our modeling phase. And then I'll make a closure. All right, so firstly, a brief outline of Kahramanmaraş earthquakes. So uh, on the 6th of February 2023, we experienced we experienced two very big earthquakes, 7.8 magnitude 7.8 earthquake early in the morning at 4:17, and then right after about nine hours, we experienced another very large earthquake with magnitude 7.6, and you know this region in particular. Oops. All right, so this region in particular, the southeast, southwest uh, segments of uh, Eastern Anatolian Fault has been silent at least for about 500 years. years. So there were small earthquakes, but I mean, the big ones, the last big one was about 500 years ago. And for the second one here, yeah, it's been silent for about, again, 500 years, and all of a sudden they ruptured. Actually, people, the scientists, the earth scientists, they have been expecting such an event. Anyway, okay. So the challenging point at this point at this, uh, in these earthquakes was for us at two very large unexperienced, I mean, uh, um, unexpected earthquakes, 7.8 and nine hours after 7.6. And when I heard the 7.6, I said, we're gonna collapse. Essentially, we will, this country will finish. It, I mean, that was the feeling I just felt at that moment. So it was a real challenge science-wise. And thanks to our colleagues, um, actually Professor Punar, who worked on the Coulomb stress distribution of this, we wanna know what's, the reason behind it. So this is the Coulomb stress distribution of the first event. Essentially what I'm showing here is the Coulomb stress distribution of the first event. And you see that there is some sort of extra surcharge to the uh, chardak surge fault segment that ruptured in the, uh, as in the second event. And because there's a high slip rate on that fault, on that fault segment, the magnitude was immense. And the other interesting feature was that the first earthquake started at a very small segment somewhere, oops, somewhere here. 
which is the gnarly segment, and then jumped onto the main branch and then ruptured bilaterally. So this was another uh, interesting phenomenon of, of these events. So these are the uh, fault geometries, the surface projection that we used in our modeling. Essentially, the first event is like really 300 kilometers rupture length, and the second event is like really 150 kilometers rupture length. And the first event dips towards south east okay and then the other is towards north okay and uh we we used i mean we had recordings uh from, from more than six uh, 380 79 strong motion stations with maximum rupture distances of uh 603 630 kilometers and our colleague uh Oscar Kale studied in particular the direct uh, the, the the recordings with strong directivity effects so we understood that we had to include the forward directivity in our modeling as part of the ground motions all right okay so this is sort of the model we used in our ground motion modeling we used the the for, uh, the uh, choi and speedish two what I'm showing actually is the contour. So the green uh, region here, mostly the Kahraman Maraj province, is in the backward in the backward directivity region during the first event, and we, this, the strong effect of forward directivity is towards Hatay, Osmaniye, partly Gaziantep, as well as Adiyaman. And for, as for the second event, the north. Part of Kahraman Maraj province is affected by the forward directivity effect, whereas the rest of the province is uh, really not affected by the for, uh, forward directivity effect. Uh, and if we have skipped, all right, the forward directivity effects, the rate of difference between considering uh, forward directivity and without considering direct forward directivity is something like 15 centimeters per second in peak ground velocity because we are using this intense intensity metric peak ground velocity in our uh, loss modeling and in our ground motion modeling. There is a long history why we are using this one because since I graduated from my PhD, I started running my uh, nonlinear response to analysis and and I tried to relate it with the PGV and it it was nice the results for me. All right, so this is actually a comparison we made. What's ha happening in terms of real ground motions and what we what we predicted in the national code, and I'm only giving you two case studies uh from Kahraman Maraj I'm going to only consider Kahraman Maraj in my all case studies because trying to say everything for the entire region is difficult so you see this is the one of the really centers of the Kahraman Maraj province this this sub sub province district Monikishibat district so um, what I'm uh, comparing is here is the 0.2 second hazard curve the uh, the solid black is the mean one, which is used by the national map, and uh, one, one second hazard curve again. And the gray region over there is the five uh, and ninety five percentile range, uh, uh, describing the uncertainty. And in the second, it's the same. Um, I mean, on the panel in the second row is just the same thing, but now uh, for another recording station. We again, Oskan did this analysis. We uh, essentially uh, 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 rescaled the ground motions to reference bedrock, all right, with some assumptions. And then the red uh, the vertical lines over there uh, represent the recorded, recorded, and then the uh, the other ones represent the 475 and 2,500 years return period. So the ground motion the, at that region where almost highly uh, urbanized region, the, uh, the, uh, the 
estimations of uh, our national map is doing well and the ground motion was not that much as expected all right okay so i'll start with the laws before coming to the uh, sensitivity and so forth this is i mean i know vitor is looking at it like yeah, i've been doing this for a long time the components that i'm uh, going to focus on so yeah, for an existence probability of loss given a single risk at a c at a single site the loss is being affected by the vulnerability, all right, conditioned on the VS30. If you assume VS30, the site condition as, as a random parameter, the others are really magnitude or distance, they're just deterministic. And the occurrence probability of IM, given the VS30, and then the probability of occurrence of VS30. So essentially, what you have as for a single site and for a single risk, the, the loss is being affected by the vulnerability as well as the site condition. But if you're dealing with the portfolio, then the loss is going to be affected by the portfolio distribution, the special distribution of the portfolio, as well as the uh, portfolio granularity. By saying the granularity, I refer to, uh, say, building types, the year build, whatever you just uh, assume or guess describing the physical properties of the portfolio. And I mean, for, for two and a half years, I'm in the sector, when you have the large database portfolios, you have all sorts of different, say, types, versions. Some deliver you a very nice portfolio, whereas some just say, this is the building and this is the value of policy I sold, that's it. So you have to come up answers to all of these one by one. And this was the case for the Karshaman Major Quake as well. All right, so we did before, I mean, while modeling our loss, uh, we did sensitivity analysis. And so we focused on the uncertainty in VS30. Uh, so we considered the medium VS30 in our analysis and then the distribution of the VS30 at each site. And then we uh, considered special distribution of portfolio as an uncertainty because as i told you some deliver their uh, data lumped at the sub province centers and some just give the whole data well described geographically so we assume portfolio lumped at the district centers and then portfolio distributed at 0 0.1 0 0.05 and 0 0.25 degrees uh, cells within the provinces and then the vulnerability model the mean vulnerability versus vulnerability as a distribution. This is also important because, you know, sometimes we have to come up with some quick answers. So to save some runtime, you do everything in terms of mean, and then you can elaborate your results. But firstly, you have to do some stuff for uh, to see the overall thing. So essentially, that's why it is important. And then the granularity of portfolio, I'm not going to talk too much of it because I say, I experienced lots of different versions of portfolios with, with a good uh, geographic distribution, I'm sorry, uh, portfolio, granular to a portfolio. So sometimes the, the pro physical properties of the portfolio is well-defined, but sometimes you have different, say, um, uh, misreported uh, properties like the building height, year build, and sometimes they all misreported, they don't exist. They just say building. And then modeling of two sequential events, this is also quite, it, this was a challenge for us. So uh, two events separately, you could have considered it or come up with something smart to account for the uh, effects of these two sequential event, uh, events. So essentially what I'm showing here is the influence of BS30 site conditions. So I'm showing the first row, the 84 percentile, values of VS30, the second row of the 50 median, per, median VS30 values for different grid sizes. So the, from the finest to the coarse, the coarse level is really everything is lumped at the sub-province center. So you see a site could be like really soft to stiff or vice versa from stiff to soft, depending on the uncertainty, the way you are handling. In the 
uh, on the rightmost case. Now, if you lump everything at the sub-province center, then the whole sub-province is really like a single VS third value. You can consider it as a distribution or as, a, as its medium, but it's all everything the same. Soft soil, for example, whatsoever. So that's that's something we had to, we had to uh, taste, and this is the portfolio distribution. Again, I'm focusing on Karaman Maraj province only. So as I told you, sometimes you have nicely distributed data, but then again, on at the other marginal end, you only have everything lumped at the sub province center. So essentially, this is also going to affect your results. The important is thing is that at what level does it affect your results? Okay, so this is the whole thing. So consideration of vulnerability, uncertainty, or use only the mean, all right? If you focus on the uh, uncertainty, then given a peak ground velocity value, you will be considering the damage as a distribution. Whereas if you are really focusing on the mean, it's only a single point. And if you just think that you have at a single point, sometimes you, you had to model, say, hundreds or tens of risks. So using only a single damage ratio or loss value, it will, be, it will have its own practical way of, say, shooting a target. And the granularity of portfolio. Nicely defined portfolio with everything like the year build, the height of the building, or number of stories and everything well defined. And, and then the other margin is, oh, the other margin is this one. I have building portfolio in my database. So you, you, you have to sort of find it out what is the ups and downs of this kind of missing information? Or uh, so essentially, when if you have a nice uh, portfolio granularity, you will you'll be considering the uncertainties in a much better way. Otherwise, it's only a single curve if you if you think of everything in terms of mean. All right. So this is what our modeling say uh, is doing. Actually, not I, I will not be able to tell you the whole details, but. So if you are facing only a single earthquake, only a single earthquake, this gray curve in terms of mean vulnerability. But if you are really facing two events with very little differences, it could have been a big aftershock as well, but then you have to modify your original vulnerability curve conditioned on the damage that you got from the first event. And then, this is really shifting the horizontal and vertical axis in a proper way. And this is, you know, uh, you can do it with some, what we call as modifying functions, making an overall assumption about the physical behavior of your portfolio against a large earthquake, all right? The, the dynamic behavior of your portfolio against a large earthquake. So again, these modifying functions, I'm going to explain each one of these the assumptions and everything. So, uh, so they are, again, conditioned on the damage of first event uh, to compute the accumulated loss in the portfolio. All right, so now I'll start giving you the uh, sensitivity analysis results. The first case is quite simple. So as for the base case, the simplest model, portfolio granularity as is, is as is, well-defined, everything is well-defined. And then portfolio special distribution, portfolio is lumped at the sub-province center. And then vulnerability, use mean vulnerability, and then VS30, use mean VS30, medium VS30, whatever, at the lump side. And then now start looking at the effect of each parameter. Each time you turn on and off one of the parameters. The first case is that we're now opening the VS30. So VS30 is treated as distribution, and then the rest is just off. 
And then the second case, they are really focusing on the vulnerability uncertainty, the rest is off. And in the third case, we are focusing on the special distribution of the portfolio. So the fine special distribution of portfolio 0.025, uh, and then everything is off, the simplest way. And then case four, five, and six, we are looking at the portfolio effects, disregard building uh, height variation, disregard year build, and then disregard both building and year build. Everything is single building type, residential building point, period. So these are the now, uh, say, normalized, normalized loss distributions between median and mid four percentiles, okay? And what I'm showing here is base case compared to the other case studies, the loss distribution of the other cases. So essentially what I'm showing here is that for the first three cases, Regardless of the earthquake, the first event or the second event, the median doesn't change. You see the red dashed lines show the trends in the median for each case. The median doesn't change. The dispersion, yes, there is some sort of change, variation in dispersion. But in the fourth, fifth, and sixth cases, the axis of the loss distribution starts shifting, depending on which uh, say physical property is shut, the others dominate, and the axis of loss distribution is shifting. It's just the same for both cases. In the second se sensitivity analysis, we did just did the opposite now. We started, we chose the base case as the most complicated one. A portfolio as is, everything is very well defined. And then portfolio special distribution with the fine breathing, grid, grid. Vulnerability, distributed vulnerability. VS30, consider all the uncertainties. And then shot one, case one, mean VS30 only, medium VS30 only, and then the others are distributed and blah, blah. Case two, case three, mean vulnerability, the rest is on, off, sorry, excuse me. And case three, lump at each sub province center. And as for the last three cases, we focused on the portfolio granularity, disregard building height variation, disregard year build, disregard both building and year build. Now, again, the same type of plots here. And what I'm again showing is that the median doesn't change for the first three cases, whatever you do, but then the rest is really shifted from one side to the other. Case three. Case three. All right. Really? Okay. And as for the third intricate interaction interaction between loss and VS30 vulnerability uncertainty, th this is because VS30 uncertainty affects the ground motion distributions, which eventually affect the loss distribution due to inflated, deflated vulnerability uncertainty. And as for the fourth one, the underreported portfolio granularity, height variation, year build, 
shift the loss distribution. And this is because the damage uh, modalities of the portfolio are biasedly affected due to deficient physical properties of assets in the portfolio. All right, so difficult English, long, I'm sorry. I'll explain it to you, Helen. <laughs> That's it. Okay, so now, as for the other case, I mean, consideration of sequential effect. Now, as I told you, these are the modifying functions or models we used to account for the uh, sequential effects of two events. They are conditioned on the damage of the first earthquake. Um, so essentially, the base case, you can use the maximum of first and second earthquakes. The case one here represents uh, portfolio exhibits, the overall portfolio exhibits very slow deterioration after the first earthquake. The case three is portfolio exhibits moderate deterioration after the first earthquake, the overall trend. And the fifth case, portfolio severely deteriorates after the first event. And the other two is in between those margin margins. So what we are, what I'm showing here is that now again, the distributions again, 16 median and 84% of distribution, assuming that the portfolio is lumped at the sub province center and accounting for the VS30 and vulnerable to distribution. So just focus on the median values here, the, uh, the central point, how they shift. So depending on the mod, um, uh, modifying function you are using, essentially, the loss changes significantly. So the question here is, how are you going to find the most suitable one for your uh, portfolio? So then you have to make some, uh, you have to follow an approach methodology. This is what we followed essentially. So step one, collect damage states of port building portfolio from public open databases. The ministry had that kind of information. Uh, after it started uh, disseminating that information after the earthquakes and compute a reference damage index, compute a reference damage, damage index from the entire portfolio to select a fairly suitable, you cannot find the best one, modifying model among the alternatives, all right? And then the second step is perform loss analysis, a kind of sensitivity analysis with the alternative modify, modifying models uh, and this should depend on the resolution of damage data. Most of the time, right after the earthquakes, the damage data revealed has a lot of, say, is a, has a coarse granularity. Essentially, that resolution of damage portfolio data would be the guidance on the level of complexity. So, for example, loss estimations we did, that's what we did, are at sub-province level if compiled damage is very crude. And then as for the last step, compare loss estimations of alternative modifying models with the reference damage indices. So in a way, error analysis. And now I'm going to show you one specific case. So this is the ministry's damage data started to be uh, disseminated right after the, uh, these two events. Uh, so these are the sub-province names of the Kahramanmaraş province. And from no damage to collapse, we have, say, sort of accumulated data. Uh, they, after a while, stopped releasing this information, but we caught it at on the 27th of two. Okay, so then we have the reference index. This is actually, as FEMA Hazes or ATC 13 indicate, this is the compound loss, all right? So depending on the local fragilities, you just uh, assumed uh, some probability of occurrence for light, moderate uh, collapse, and severe damage, and then you uh, end up with this reference index. And then for the three cases, case one, case three, and case five, case five, assuming that the uh, portfolio after the first event uh, is uh, very slowly deteriorated, moderately de deteriorated, or severely deteriorated, we computed the median losses, so the maps over there lumped median losses, and then made some very simple statistical analysis, error analysis, and we picked case three, and this is the results we came up and we reported to TCIP after this modeling stage. So, on, so these, all of these numbers for the entire provinces, 11 provinces, so we, we did not, our goal was not to shoot 
an accurate, precise loss level for the whole, say, sub-province or province, but an overall number. And these are the numbers I got from TCIP as of uh, next past week, all right? So they, they paid all, all the way up to 26.32 billion liras, and our mean estimated loss was, uh, is 25.3 billion. All right, I took it long, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to read this. Thank you. Thank you. We've, we've got a couple of minutes for, uh, for, a, for a question or two. And I know there might be some coming in online as well, but as, if the room will take I, that. I, mean, I know it's quite hard to digest everything all at once. I know. Any, any questions? Yes. We got a microphone? Thank you, Sinan. That was a great presentation. Uh, lots of questions, but I'll just sum it to simple understanding of ground motion uncertainties in each of those cases. How did you handle the ground motion uncertainties coming from ground motion models constrained by some observations? How the model, the ground motion uncertainties, we just considered the aleatory variability. So we took the ground motion as a distribution uh, in terms of modeling uncertainty, just for the uh, this Kahraman Maraj event, uh, we used Choi and uh, Choi and Young's uh, Choi and Spudich forward trajectory model. So it means we used Choi and Young's because it is it has the power of, or it uh, it is the capability of predicting PGV including the uh, forward trajectory effects. The uh, and then. Uh, in that in, I mean, essentially, their modeling uncertainty is our modeling uncertainty. So essentially, we only focused on the aleatory variability part of the ground motion. But we, uh, from the recorded uh, stations, recording stations, we corrected their event term to make everything suitable for these two uh, earthquakes. So we corrected their event term. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. So if we move on, we're staying obviously in the same area and the same topic, really. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Ahmed Bora Jehan. And uh, Ned, uh, you're here. So Ahmed is uh, from uh, Turk Reinsurance. Uh, so he's got a master's degree in structural engineering um, from Özgen University in Istanbul. And he's going to talk about national insurance uh, perspective of Turkey earthquake, please. Okay. Hello, everyone. I am Bora from Turkish Catastrophe Insurance Pool. Uh, I am very uh, happy to be here. Uh, and also, I would like to say thank you to invite us. So uh, I am talking about uh, TCIP national insurance perspective of Karomaraj earthquakes. So let's start with a proposal of TCIP. Uh, firstly, I want to uh, tell you uh, who is TCIP, what will we do, uh, etc. So uh, TCIP uh, is an insurance pool uh, with a public legal entity uh, and was established to offer uh, compulsory earthquake uh, insurance coverage. So uh, the establishment proposals of TCIP uh, is to secure all residences uh, within the scope against earthquakes uh, with affordable premiums. And uh, to decrease the uh, financial burdens uh, and to, um, and to decrease the financial burden of earthquakes on the government, uh, especially arising from the construction of disaster residences after the earthquake, and to provide um, long-term accumulation of resources for covering earthquake damages. And to distribute the financial burden of earthquake damages uh, on our country to 
residential reinsurance and capital markets. So uh, DASC, uh, I mean TCIP, has enough protection and claim payment capacity in case of earthquake by using accumulated earthquake reserve and reinsurance protection. Our payment capacity reached uh, 117 billion Turkish Rai in uh, 20, uh, 2022 and 20, 2023. This is our uh, organizational structure. I will tell briefly. Uh, TCIP is one of the best role models of public private corporation. Uh, technical and operational works are carried out um, by insurance or reinsurance company determined by the Ministry of Treasury and Finance. Um, insurance coverage uh, is provided by the organization and compulsory earthquake insurance is offered to uh, homeowners by uh, insurance companies. Uh, technically, uh, as I said, uh, Turkish catastrophic insurance pool uh, is the insurance pool. Yeah, uh, does not need a physical structuring to conduct organization-related works. Uh, instead, all works are uh, outsourced in order to increase efficiency and keep costs uh, at minimum level. Um, yeah, of course, we have a uh, corporation. Uh, public and private uh, institutions, uh, I mean like uh, Minister of uh, Interior or Ministry of uh, Environmental and Organization uh, or uh, universities. <clears throat> I, uh, now I want to tell about our product. Uh, the premium uh, is calculated according to the uh, risk groups uh, based on uh, earthquake Risk, uh, earthquake risk zones. So we have seven risk group uh, uh, in our product. Uh, now we are uh, covering just uh, earthquake, uh, but uh, we are planning to implement the other natural hazards uh, at the end of the year. So, I mean, these, hazard, these hazards uh, uh, are uh, flooding, landslides, uh, hail, to uh, tornado, a hurricane, wildfire, uh, and volcanic eruption. So uh, our uh, average premium is 100 of, uh, 105 Turkish RA, and our uh, penetration rate across the Turkey is 59%. Um, we have... Uh, um, I, we have 11.8 uh, million uh, policy across the Turkey, uh, by the way. Uh, so let's continue. Yeah, uh, these are the uh, natural catastrophic operations processes. The first one, the first one is loss assessment process, uh, as you know. The second one is uh, loss adjustment management. The third one, operation center management, and fourth one, operation coordination management. So. Uh, I will go. Uh, the main uh, aim is to increase the penetration rate. Uh, we want to reach 100% uh, across the Turkey. Uh, and yeah, let's go. Yeah. Uh, these are the indemnification, indemnifications uh, of uh, bird case. Uh, since its establishment, TCIP has made claim payments over uh, 27 billion Turkish lira uh, for uh, 451 uh, claim files. As you notice that uh, in 2023, uh, there's a sudden uh, jump uh, for claim files and payments. Uh, yeah, uh, as, you, uh, as you know that this is because the Karamara shortcake. Uh, Let's look uh, last uh, last earthquakes uh, in the um, three years. Uh, in 2020, in 2020, we experienced uh, Izmir earthquake. Uh, 
claim um, 31,000 claim files uh, was opened and we paid uh, 435 million Turkish lira. And uh, this earthquake uh, magnitude is uh, 6.8. And uh, Elazığ earthquake we experienced uh, in the same year uh, in 2020. Uh, 40,000 claim files are opened. Uh, also, we um, paid the 392 million Turkish lira. Uh, in 2019, Istanbul slavery earthquake we, we have experienced. Uh, 16,000 claim files uh, was opened and uh, 70 uh, million Turkish lira we are paid. Uh, so last year we experienced Düzce uh, earthquake. Uh, the magnitude of this earthquake, earthquake is 5.9. Total claim file 17,000 uh, and we paid 165 million. Uh, Turkish run. Yeah, uh, we are. We came to Karamara shortcake. Uh, as you know, we experienced 6th February. Uh, we experienced uh, the West Eating earthquake. So uh, this data based on the 5th May, but I checked, to, I checked today uh, that our uh, claim files uh, reach uh, 5 uh, 160,000, uh, yeah. We uh, paid, uh, we claim, we uh, we are paid uh, 40, the 30, 24 billion Turkish lira. As you notice that the red dots are represent, represent uh, every uh, claim uh, files. So these are, as you know, uh, 11 uh, cities affected by this earthquake. Uh, the average penetration rate uh, is uh, 50%. The, the total number of policy uh, at, the, at these uh, cities, uh, 1 million, uh, 1,000, uh, we have a policy. Yes, the, this table represents the uh, paid claim files number and our indemnity. Uh, for the slight damage, uh, we, uh, by the way, the, these data based on 5th May. Uh, for the slight damage, we have, uh, we say, uh, three, uh, 300,000 uh, claim file. Uh, for moderate damage, 34,000 uh, claim file. Yeah, most of them are slight, slight damage uh, we have. Uh, but when we look indemnity ratio, uh, as you know, uh, collapse, extensive damage, and partial collapse uh, are the highest, uh, has the highest ratio. Yeah, these. The, the bottom uh, graphics represent the, our indemnification by extent of damages. For slight damage, we paid uh, 6 billion Turkish lira. For moderate damage, we pay uh, 2.8 uh, Turkish lira. And for collapse, uh, extensive damage and partial collapse uh, damages, we paid uh, 15 billion uh, Turkish lira. So uh, I want to tell, uh, also I want to tell average indemnity uh, for uh, damages, slight damages, uh, 32 uh, Turkish lira, 32,000 Turkish lira, and moderate damage is uh, 83,000 Turkish lira. For collapse, extensive damage and partial collapse uh, is, uh, average indemnity is uh, 194 uh, thousand Turkish lira. So uh, the right graphic represents the number of notifications. The second week uh, we had uh, a peak, so uh, notifications uh, still going on uh, because people are uh, abandoning their home, city, 
uh, also city. So uh, notifications are uh, still going on. So the, uh, this map uh, represents the indemnification, uh, indemnifications uh, by extent of damages in cities. Uh, as you notice that uh, for collapse, extensive damage uh, and a partial collapse uh, scenario, the highest rate uh, has uh, Hatay and Karomaraj, uh, Malatya. These are uh, Hatay is here. Yeah, Karomaraj is here and Malatya is uh, here. Yeah. Uh, total. Uh, we for the Hatay has the highest uh, indemnification, uh, so it is uh, seven billion Turkish lira, and then Karomaraj has uh, two point uh, three point five Turkish lira, and Malatya has uh, five point uh, five uh, billion Turkish lira. The maps represent the number of claim files. Uh, by extent of damages in cities. Uh, as you notice that, again, Hatay has the highest uh, number of, uh, total number of claim file. Uh, it's about 60,000. Uh, yeah. Uh, Karomaraj has uh, 50,000 uh, number of claim file and Malatya 50,000 uh, claim file uh, also. When we uh, look distribution of the damages uh, on the uh, extent of the number of claim files, uh, the slight damage is the highest ratio. So, um, yeah, when we look at the uh, this graph, Adyaman, uh, Hatay, and Malatya uh, also. Uh, Karomaraj has the highest uh, ratio of collapse, extensive damage, uh, or partially collapse scenario. So, uh, thank you for your attention. Yeah, nice, plenty of time for, uh, for some questions. So, do we have any questions for Ahmed? And I'm thinking also if there's any from the room. Can I ask a question? One thing is, yeah. so can you say something a little bit about the penetration of yeah. earthquake coverage? Of so earthquake insurance is mandatory now in Turkey. Is that just for new builds or is that applied retrospectively to previous ones? I mean, what, what is the extent of insured losses in that, that region? All those buildings we're saying, are they all insured or mm -hmm. is many of those ones still not insured? Could you say something about the general coverage? Yeah. Uh, we can open the uh, slide. Ooh. Can we open the slide? Yeah, this slide. Uh, you can see, uh, you can see on the table, yeah. uh, each city has penetration rate for, um, I mean, uh, like, for example, for Karomaraj, uh, we have 40, uh, 54 uh, percent penetration rate. But all is that buildings the, then? Is yeah, that residential, residential buildings. Yeah, residential buildings. So uh, high, when we look at the table, the highest penetration rate is Gaziantep. Uh, it has 65 percent penetration rate, yeah. And can you say a little bit just uh, about... Uh, why are they at that level? What is the obstacle to getting them increasing? Is yeah. it kind of a social problem about people not wanting it, trying to avoid it yeah. or something? Actually, uh, people don't want to insure their home yeah. because um, it's like it's about the social awareness. Yeah. Uh, in Turkey, uh, insurance, uh, people, they think uh, insurance is not important. So, yeah, 
I mean, uh, they about the social awareness of the insurance. Okay, I've got other ones I'm interested in, but I just want to, please. So could you just say who you are and just ask your question? Thank you. I think we'll wait for a microphone. Now. Okay, my name is Dilesh Shom. I'm in uh, Moody's RMS uh, organization. So my question is that you, we saw that there are a lot of buildings that are damaged, right? We saw the damage statistics. So based on your experience, so can you tell us like what percentage of claims that has been filed and what, how many remaining uh, uh, the claims you are expecting that it will be filed later on? Can you repeat the last of your question? What percentage of claim has already been filed mm -hmm. and, and what is remaining? Because there are people probably still will be filing uh, the insurance claims, right? Um, yeah. So, uh, can you repeat last <laughs> part? So I, I don't understand. Okay, so asked. you know that uh, not all the people has already filed their, their insurance claims, right? Can you, can, okay, can you, yeah. not all the people has filed insurance claims, right? Uh -huh. There are people, you, you mentioned that probably people are, move far away from their homes they are yeah. still kind of recovering from uh, from all the damages and maybe uh, some personal uh, issues and others so my question is that what percentage of claims you are thinking that uh, it it is remaining it has to ah. be filed yeah actually we are thinking to, to do... actually uh, what can i say um, we are thinking to uh, all claims are reported to us. So remain the claims, uh, we are thinking too small. So uh, I said we have now uh, 560,000 claim file. So uh, we are estimating uh, 6,000 uh, 6, claim file at the end of the uh, all these processes. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Right. Thanks for that. I think Vito's got a question down in the front. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Vito from Jim. So, um, as, as Ian mentioned, you know, in some places, insurance penetration is quite low. And uh, we've seen, for example, in New Zealand that having a high insurance penetration helps a lot with the recovery process. Do you think that now that there was this devastating event in Turkey that you know, the risk awareness might be a little bit stronger amongst the population. So more people will, um, you know, purchase this kind of protection. Uh, that's part one of the question. And the second part is, you know, this funds with a claim, is this, you know, basically just to rebuild houses or is there also any other support for other type of recovery for the infrastructure or something like that? Yeah, uh, TCIP is covering just a rebuilding of the, building so uh, we are not covered uh, land value or uh, or uh, expensive uh, non-structural elements uh, for example so TCIP uh, ju just covering uh, uh, rebuilding the building um, so yeah uh, the, the first part of your question uh, I mean, uh, the, in the Turkey, uh, insurance uh, social awareness is so low. Yeah, uh, our uh, aim is to uh, increase this uh, social awareness of uh, insurance uh, and the penetration. Our uh, penetration rate. We want to increase our penetration rate uh, to reach one hundred percent across the Turkey. So, yeah, uh, I can say that. Sure, I, I understand that. But my question is, do you think that now there was this event, there's a stronger risk awareness in the country? So do you see that there's, uh, you know, more people purchasing uh, insurance? Yeah, after the earthquake, uh, after the earthquake, in, uh, the new policy number are jumped. Yeah, increased jump. Uh, you don't believe that, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, you are welcome. 
Any other questions? Yes, Mauro. Oh, no, sorry, before Mauro. Hi, I'm Shubhru from ImageCat. Um, you mentioned that uh, TCIP is a good model for public-private partnership uh, in terms of affordability, I think, which is linked to the retention rate. Is there any subsidy that the government provides or uh, and can an individual homeowner afford that? Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, uh, I can give an example. So uh, in... Uh, for for uh, for this earthquake, uh, I mean Karamara earthquake, uh, we cooperated with uh, Urban and Ever Ever Ministry of Urban and Environmental. Uh, so uh, we used their uh, loss adjusters for the uh, quick assessment. So uh, yeah, um, we cooperate uh, many. Uh, public and private uh, corporate institutes, uh, like I said. So, yeah, I can say that. Okay, oh, there's a question that's just come in. Maybe get a microphone across that. Oh, you got one, perfect. Uh, so we have a question from David Gregory online, who's asked, uh, with the high inflation rate experienced in Turkey in recent years, do you have a feel of how this has impacted the claims paid out? So the so, inflation rate in Turkey has been uh -huh. very high. Yeah. Has that affected the, the claims paid out? The, the amounts of claims paid out? I mean, the total amount? Is that what the question is asking? Uh, it simply says, do you have a feel of how this has impacted the claims paid out? So, yeah, Every year, uh, we are increasing our uh, rebuilding, um, rebuilding prices. So, yeah, uh, we know the, uh, in Turkey we have high inflation. But uh, same rate uh, we are implementing to our uh, rebuilding uh, prices. Yeah. Okay, I think we sh <laughs> just got in there. Okay, is that a quick one? Quick question? You think the, the microphone is just there? And then I'll be the last one. Hi, I'm Marco from MHS. <clears throat> My question for you is that I understand that I'm not expert of Turkey, but I do understand that there is a, a sector of informal housing in Turkey, as in many similar countries there is. Is your insurance also like uh, uh, serving this segment of dwellers or what are the requirements? Thank you. No, we are not covering these buildings. Uh, the buildings, uh, the buildings uh, should uh, Follow the building, our building codes. So uh, if the building has not uh, um, has has not building code, uh, so we are not insured uh, that building. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Thank that you. happened. So the the problem with the Jackie Condo. Um, so. That draws it to close the first section of this session. We're now going to move to a panel discussion, and it's going to be hosted by uh, by Michael, by Michael Ewald. And I'll let Michael introduce and bring up the panel that it's going to be uh, addressing this. But the panel session is looking at lessons learned regarding post earthquake impact assessment, and that's where as we shift the course. Yes, and uh, the order. Or can yeah. we just choose? Okay, so sorry. good. Yeah, sorry. Now there's uh, uh, just the last, um, maybe last technicalities. <laughs> can Can you hear me? No. Yes. No. Also, I have a microphone. You cannot hear me. That's. How does this? Uh, yes, you you can have this now better. Now better. Still, you can hear me even if I'm away from the phone. Then I just stay here. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm I'm. <laughs> I have the great pleasure, and it's an honor to to moderate this panel that we will have. Um, maybe I, I just start introducing the speakers. Um, so we have uh, Sinan Akka that you already heard before. 
and maybe just come uh, as, as we speak <laughs> to the stage and we see then also we have one remote. Um, then we have Professor Erdik. Uh, so these two gentlemen <laughs> basically represent really the, the, the absolute capacity in, in, uh, in the academia in earthquake engineering and engineering seismology for Turkey. Then we have to balance that a little bit um, to really almost like founding members of the, the modeling community. We have Nile Shom from uh, Moody's RMS with us. And you have to help me. Do we have, do we have Jay online now? Yeah. Yes, and we have Jay in from uh, various AIR online remote with us. Let's see if, if that works. Hello? Can, can you hear me? I need to be unmuted. We can hear you. Oh, if thank you. you. <laughs> Um, with you, however, do you have a, a camera on your I laptop? I think so, but I think you have disabled the camera at your end, so you have to enable it. Maybe you can you can sort this out. And uh, in the meanwhile, we have the last speaker here. Uh, that is uh, Jaime Abad Perez from the European Commission. Um, who will uh, present a little bit and then say a bit the, the connecting piece. So. Uh, connecting, say, modeling and on-ground information as he's really responsible for um, risk management at yeah, the European level. Um, and yeah, all together, we're looking at more than uh, a century of experience in the field. And I'm very curious to hear what these, uh, these guys have to say. We asked them to, to start it Maybe each one with a bit a uh, um, picking up maybe on on the comprehensive keynote from Sinan, picking its own individual aspects where you want to set your highlights, and then from there we we go into the questions, and I'm I'm sure this will be a very enlightening session. Um, we don't have a particular order, or we can start from however we like. as we wish. Um, we maybe start with Professor Erdik then, if that's okay with everyone. And does it work with the camera for Jay? Still okay? Um, no, no, just, it'll just oral. That's completely fine. That's completely fine. We, we can also... Um, I don't think the, the time located will allow for that, you know. So. That's perfectly fine. Okay, should I go ahead? Please. Well, actually, <laughs> I was I was given a question. I was trying to respond to that question, so I'll, I'll do that. The question that was given to me as an expert of earthquake in, in Turkey: What can you tell us? What was expected and what was unexpected? So I'll I'll I'll, I'll start with that one. Okay, that would be fantastic. Okay, otherwise, uh, well, obviously as a Regarding the consequence, there are two consequences for a given earthquake. One of them is the ground motion. The other one is the damage and the casualties. Regarding the ground motion, well, in certain areas, the ground motion was expected as expected with the code and with the, the related uh, ground motion models. The, there are two things over there. One of them is that the distribution of the strong ground motion networks was biased. So they were all located along the fault lines. Uh, so anything going vertical to the fault, you don't see much. Lots of near field records, so that there's a bias over there. The second is that the the ground motion was really high in Hatay region, partly due to directivity, but mostly to the basin effects. And our code does not consider basin effects unless the designer considers by themselves, and that really uh, increases the motion a lot for most of for one second structures. Those are 10 store structures that essentially most of them are. So that's the reason of the heavy damage over that. That's the ground motion part. The second important thing is that, I mean, regarding whether we would see the same damage as we have seen in 99 earthquake, yes, the damage was very related, but we should look at the 
statistics or the or the or the damage assessment by the government very carefully. The reason being is that the number of buildings assessed by the government is close to two million. And out of that two million, only about uh, 800 of them, 800,000 of them were damaged. So I think we should look at the damage ratios between the damaged buildings. Otherwise, if you look at it as a whole, you see that the damage is much less than what you would expect. So if you look at the, if you look at the damage statistics, so starting from the light damage to heavy damage and try to see what persons join them. For example, in Hatay, we see that 50% of the damage of the buildings were uh, received major to collapse type of damage, 50%. That, if you look at our past uh, vulnerability data using intensity, that would correspond to about intensity uh, close to 10, between nine and 10 probably easily. And the, on the overall, overall all country, if you look at the just the damaged buildings to demonstrate the, for the collapse and heavy damage buildings about 32%, and that would correspond to about intense and nine for the whole region. So the, the question is that, yes, the damage is quite comparable to what we have seen in the 1999 earthquake, except that we should treat the uh, government-based data carefully that just look at the damage stuff. If, if you consider whole buildings, you see that the persons are lower. That's one thing that you should keep in mind. As I said, the ground motion is based on effects are important. Now, Coming to what was, uh, I would say, what was the unexpected, what was unexpected is the low percentage of medium damage buildings. The medium damage buildings, their percentage was in the about, you know, three, four, five percent in that range among all damaged buildings. And if you look at the past vulnerability relationship in Turkey, you would see at least expect to see about 20 percent range over there. The reason for that is twofold. One of them is that the, the government assessors may have pushed either to the uh, heavy damaged or the weak damaged one. That's one thing. Second thing is that due to the uh, real brittle buildings. Now, the com if you compare to the old old, old 1990 earthquake in Turkey, the average building height was about probably five. In this one, it, it turns to be about 10. And with 10 story buildings, and if you have soft stories, the damage is much higher than what you would in a five-story five, five story building. So we should look at it both ways, but that shows that the what was unexpected is that the vulnerability relationships predicted the medium damage very low. Again, uh, what was expected is the high damage in the buildings built after 2000, because in connection with the 1999 earthquake, we had to institute new regulations. Well, new codes, one thing. Second thing, we institute the uh building uh, construction uh, checking so there were several institutions that checked the quality of construction so i was expecting that the that the at least for when it comes to the heavy damage there would be much less heavy damage in the plus 2000 uh, buildings that's not the case about 20 percent of the heavily damaged to collapse buildings are built post 2000 so that shows that the well the construction quality one thing but there is no way of checking the quality of the design. So that they check the construction, but not the design. And that way, I think we should instigate the both the, uh, I would say the professional engineering and also liability, liability insurance for this type of engineering. And well, we are pushing the arm for those things. Yes. Now, apart from that, the, the, good, the good things is that, for example, in 1990 earthquake, the schools were damaged. In this earthquake, there were about 20,000 educational buildings, about 12,000 schools, and only about 3% of them collapsed. That's for two things. One of them is that their designs and the constructions are much more controlled. Second is, the, is that the weak ones were retrofitted. So that shows the success of the retrofit. Uh, regarding hospitals, there were uh, four hospitals that were non-functional, some with due to damage and mostly due to the uh, non-structural damage. And there were close to nine base isolated hospitals, and they mostly functioned well. So that shows that the you know building hospitals with the base isolation is a very good choice. That was another thing. 
the main infrastructure performed very well. There were about 150 dams. There was only one dam that required the, the release of the water, but controlled release. The whole others had some cracks, but no problem. The other things about there were about more than 1,000 bridges. Only 15 of them had some damage, no collapses. I mean, if you look at even United States, California, and Japan, and even in 99 earthquake in Turkey, there were several uh, bridge collapses with much less ground motion. So that's a success story by itself. And the, the same holds for the tunnels, no damage. And the, there were five major airports, just the runway damage and some non-structural damage, no problem at all. Uh, Regarding the TCIP, there was a good presentation on that. Regarding TCIP, I think the, the success of the TCIP was the management of the claims. They received about, well, close to 550,000 claims, and they were mostly processed and managed well. That's a good success story. The other thing that's interesting is that the distribution of damage in the claims and the distribution of damage on the, in the overall area are somewhat different. The, the number, the number of collapsed buildings in the TCIP damage statistics is much less, and the number of buildings with minimum damage or minor damage is much higher than the other one. So that shows that we don't have a problem with the moral hazards in Turkey, essentially, in that sense. So that's that's about it. I think I've taken enough time, and then probably other colleagues will continue. Thank you very much. Um, maybe in, in the interest of time, we continue with the, the modeling, um, where we have, I think, two, you have a few slides prepared, if I understand. Yes? Okay, super. Oh, no, no, for modeling the question. Okay. So I have, do you want to show the slide? So. That is, yeah, just let me stand because I cannot see my slides. So thank you, Jam, for giving me the opportunity to present in this uh, conference. So I'll, I'll briefly talk about like uh, some of the things like what we did from the modeling side and then uh, also like, uh, the, first of all, just to give you some background. Like uh, when, uh, after the event happened, so the, as a modeling company, we have to provide some loss estimation to the industry. So uh, just to give you background that we, uh, uh, we, what we did is that we, our guideline uh, was there at the, the, uh, the loss for this event for the insurance industry would be in excess of $5 billion, which is about 100 billion tur uh, Turkish lira. And the economic loss for this event was uh, we we provided the guideline is more than 25 billion US dollars, so which is about 500 billion Turkish lira. So that was our uh, the, our uh, guideline to the industry, and our uh, estimation of the economic loss doesn't include the uh, losses due to uh, the losses for the government building or bridges and others, and no, no infrastructure loss. So what worked very well for us uh, for this event is that we at the very, within few days, we had the uh, ground motion records from uh, uh, about for 260 hundred recording stations, uh, we had the ground motion records and we used that information to constrain some of our uh, estimation of the losses. So that kind of, uh, that worked very well. And we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, some of the issues with those uh, records. Secondly, is that uh, within 10 days, we found that uh, damage statistics from the building survey was available to us. So that was about 1.9 million building units. Uh, it was inspected and it was done by, it was like a monumental job from the, uh, from the people on the ground. So about 7,100 people, they collected the data and then provided the statistics to us. And we use that information to kind of constrain some of our view of the losses. And, and based on those two information, we are able to provide that guideline to the industry. So, so uh, but then what happened after that? Because then afterwards, like we saw uh, the 
losses, the incurred losses, uh, information was coming to the industry. For example, you just start from Sinan that for the uh, TCIP or the residential uh, in the uh, residential sector had about 1.3 billion uh, US dollar loss. This is about 25 to 30 billion Turkish lira. Then Peril, this is another organization which uh, which uh, which collects the data for the insurance industry, and they they also based on the data they provided the initial guideline to us that what is the initial loss uh, based on the claims submitted. Uh, so that was is about I think towards the end of March. So that was about say, 65 billion Turkish lira, which is about 3.3 billion US dollar. So, but as you know that, although we just heard that for insurance, for residential sector, probably most of the uh, claims has filed. So maybe, Shinan, you just pointed out, maybe 70 to 80% claims already been processed, maybe another 15, 20% is come, uh, will be settled soon. But for uh, uh, commercial and industrial sector, it takes, uh, it, it goes through litigation and others, it's a long process. Typically, it takes more, more than a year, uh, particularly for the large claims. So you expect that whatever the $3.3 billion uh, uh, loss, what Peril has uh, kind of provided the information, it is going to increase more. So, so we have to wait a little bit long time. And our estimation may be exceeding that, uh, that estimation. So, so, so those are all the good things. So, but what are the challenges we had? So although it looks like uh, probably we did a reasonably good job, uh, but uh, but there are a few things we need to pay attention. One is that uh, so it is related particularly for the insurance uh, insurance industry. So uh, the expectation is that when we provide some loss estimation, so we have to provide some guidance within forty eight within forty eight hours. So so that is a requirement for that is kind of what we hear from the industry. So uh, so but if you have to you have to understand that our a representation of the events, the real events in our stochastic set is a very simple representation of the uh, type of events happen happens in the industry, uh, happens in the nature. So, um, so, so, but even, again, like in within 48 hours, what we provide the guideline to the industry based on that one of the events we select from our stochastic set, which is a very simplistic re representation of the event. And uh, and we so our idea is that that information will give some idea that whether loss is large, medium, or high, so that industry can prepare themselves. But there are certain sectors in the industry, like for example, ILS sector or the cat bond sector, that is the only information they can process because they cannot use any other refinement what you what we provide later on. So there is, and they expect that this simplistic representation will be the real representation of the event. So that's not true, that, that is not going to happen. So there is some disconnect is there. The secondly is that there is expectation that within a week, we'll provide a very good estimation of the uh, loss for the, for the industry. So, so what, what you need in order to have a very good estimation of the loss from the industry, we need a we need a good representation of the fault rupture for the event, or we need a very good information about the ground motion records for that event, right? So, uh, but if we just think of with, uh, within a week, means particularly for this type of large event, people are still kind of dealing with their all personal issues, right? Some people may have lost their close relatives, some people may have dam uh, people may have injured or damaged. They are taking care of many other things, right? And then we depend the local organization or people on the ground provide all this information for, for, uh, for loss estimation for insurance industry, that's not going to happen, right? So if you, if you think of that, we, even within a week, we provide a re refined guideline that will be very close to the reality, that's not going to happen, right? So there will be a lot of uncertainties would be there. And so as an industry, we need to kind of say, set the expectation and prepare ourselves so that we can correctly use that information which comes from the modeling industry and use that information to make some decisions. So for example, like uh, the, <laughs> the initial data, what we have received, like ground motion records, right? We, we received, like I, I showed here, we have like 260 ground motion records. Those are all uh, processed automatically, right? If we talk to these people who deal with these automated ground motion records, 
So the, when you start reviewing those records manually, you can see that there are some discrepancies between the uh, information like spectral uh, values coming out from the automated process versus more uh, kind of uh, careful processing the records. There will be some differences there. And what happens is that when you have, uh, so although we have, we see uh, there are like a uh, lot of ground motion records available all over the region. So you'll find that very few recorded stations actually control the, uh, the ground motion parameter for a specific city. So unless you kind of pay close attention, there will be some discrepancies are there. So you have to kind of make sure that is right. The other thing is the, uh, dam the information coming out from the building damage statistics, you, you heard it that there, are, there might be some issues with there because those are processed very rapidly. The objective was kind of to provide some uh, life safety for the, uh, for the, uh, for, uh, for the area. So, uh, and you've had a few of those uh, topics from, from our previous speakers. <clears throat> and the last part is like hyperinflation. So what you, uh, in to, it was kind of unique for these events because in 20 to 2022, there was about like 70% inflation in Turkey. And so which means that uh, during the uh, time, uh, during the policy period, so the, the cost of goods and services increased like 70%. So, uh, so you have to figure out that, uh, so we did some adjustment for that when you provided the loss, uh, loss guidelines, but we don't know that how the industry has uh, dealt with that. So that is also another factor. So, so that's why we feel like when he provided this guideline at the end of the day, the $5 billion industry loss in excess of $5 billion industry loss, we felt that giving, giving all these uncertainties, providing a lower bound estimate is a reasonable thing to do for the industry. So with this, I'll end my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, this one. Um, we go maybe straight to Jay. Hello everyone, can you hear me, Michael? Yes, all good. So, thank you so much. Uh, sorry that I could not be in person. I am in your time zone and I'm speaking to you from Munich, although I'm based in Boston and hope to see many of you this Thursday. Uh, my name is Jay Gwyn. I uh, am Chief Research Officer at Redisk uh, Extreme Event Solutions, formerly known as AIR. Uh, I'm going to kind of speak to you on something that Nilesh already touched. So I'm trying to complement Nilesh's uh, presentation and certainly will not repeat some of the details that Sinan has also nicely given us on the details of what really happened on the ground. So if I may ask, uh, let's switch to my slides. I think I have a couple of slides that I'll go through quickly. I'm just waiting for the slide to come on screen. Yeah, but so what? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, sorry, Trey. Uh, you can hear him, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> yeah, now I get it. Um, no, Trey, you, you need to share the screen on, um, what are you saying? Zoom. Yeah, yeah. So there should be at the bottom, I think it's in Zoom, right? Share screen icon. I can share my screen. I have my slide here. If that is that visible to you? Yeah, then that should work. It will work, I'd say. Can you please so, confirm if you can see the title slide? No. Not yet, but it will work. Keep keep, keep trying. <laughs> I'm actually sharing the screen. Uh, so But I do not know if there is anything else I can do on my. Okay, let me see. Share. Uh, uh, but, yes, yes. yes. Now it's coming. Now okay. it's. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the patience. Let me see if I can go to full screen more. Okay. So what I thought is like what happens uh, for a cat modeler like the companies that Nilesh and I represent. So of course we get into a busy action oriented mode. Uh, 
our clients ex expect from us some response. Uh, so in this case, we, the earthquakes happened in rapid succession on the 6th of February. So while we were getting ready for the first event and soon enough, soon after that, the second event happened and that created a immediate set of challenges. So on the left on this slide is of course where the real earthquake happened. Our first job within a few hours, so you can see uh, on same day, 6 February, we release what we call SSEs or similar stochastic events from our stochastic catalog that our clients have. We try to extract events that are of similar characteristics. So fortunately for the East Anatolian, Southeast Anatolian fault, we had earthquakes of the magnitude uh, seven and a half to eight. So that was not a problem. Uh, so we provided events. We had some challenges with the second fault uh, because that wasn't presented in the model. And then we started working in parallel uh, to actually model the real event. And of course, it has been mentioned several times. There was a wealth of data not only the for the fault solutions, the tensor solution of the fault, uh, but actual strong motion record that we had access to with which we could develop nicer footprints for the event. One uh, important point for those of you who are not in the insurance industry, the reason we provide SSEs is most of our clients find it very difficult to model uh, even if we provide the real event in within a reasonable amount of time. This is not a problem for an insurer or an insurance portfolio like the TCIB, but it is a huge challenge for global reinsurers where they might have a few thousand portfolios in their book of business. So it's almost near impossible for them to model each and every one of those portfolios. So that's the primary value of giving a similar stochastic event. So as I said, we were developing the actual footprint. So here is a representation of what we did. We create a, created a composite of the two events. Uh, we use uh, spectral acceleration for our ground motion as a parameter, uh, 0.3 seconds, one seconds. Uh, and what you are seeing here is our model damage ratio for a mid-rise reinforced concrete frame building. Uh, so. Uh, 0.3 means 30% is the mean damage ratio we are estimating for that class of buildings. So that, that's uh, one of the reasons why for this particular event, we were so focused on damage ratios because uh, there was so much information that was there, uh, a wealth of videos that were being uh, uh, posted in many places. We could get a good handle on what is the degree of damage in many places. Uh, the second thing is what Nilesh touched on, inflation was a big known issue. Uh, so our level of confidence in the actual loss amounts on an absolute basis were rather on the lower side. Uh, that is another one reason why we encourage our clients to take these kinds of footprints and then they can overlay, overlay their uh, portfolio and do a loss analysis. And if their portfolio is representing the current values or inflation adjusted portfolio values, then hopefully that's our attempt to give them a better sense of what losses they can expect. So that's uh, one reason. Secondly, uh, one other angle I wanted to highlight here is we look at real-time events as an opportunity to test the robustness of an existing model. So although Nilesh made a very good point that uh, there is a disconnect oftentimes because the real event is quite complex, as we know, that's nature. And a stochastic model can be a simplification of real events. So often uh, when clients expect that, hey, there'll be perfection, uh, that's far from reality. But we try to still strive for how to make the stochastic model as aligned with real-time outcomes. So what we do is say, okay, if an event happened, there is a sense of loss. We first do an internal consistency. So uh, on the left chart, what we are showing you here is our OEP curve on, of insured losses for Turkey as a whole. So our occurrence exceedance probability curve for losses. Uh, this is the model that's out in the market for quite a few years. And then if we have a range of losses for the actual event we have simulated, then we overlay that and say, what is the return period of losses? So I'm emphasizing these are return period of losses, rather exceedance probabilities of losses, not actual of the event. So for Turkey as a whole, as all of you know, we have been doing modeling for Turkey. The risk is really controlled by the North Anatolian fault and in and around the Istanbul area. 
So for this event, although the losses are extreme, the damage is extreme, on the overall OEP curve, we expect uh, the our model says between 35 and 50 year return level of losses. And if we do the same exercise for some of the uh, smaller provinces, then you can say uh, the range of uh, return periods is further elongated, as you would expect. This is an extreme event. I think Sinan made the point that this earthquake, that particular fault, has not broken with this kind of a large magnitude in many hundreds of years. So for the Karaman Marash uh, province, we see it is uh, clearly up beyond a thousand year, which in our mind, again, we can rationalize that that's where the seismic gap was, a big event was anticipated, and it uh, did occur. Uh, and it changes from region to region. It's not one simple return period of losses for every province. So that's uh, one key point that we do. And of course, oftentimes there are surprises here. We might not have something like this similar, then that's usually points to a deficiency in the stochastic model. If it is there, and then it's a question of, can we rationalize the return level of losses? So I'll make my few last point is, we do see a reliable catch response uh, is an important piece of what we do for our clients, and we use it as an opportunity to test the robustness of the model. Uh, as a starting point, I think uh, magnitude events of that magnitude have to be contemplated by the model, and it's a hit or miss. Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we get it wrong. Clearly, the Tohoku earthquake in Japan was where we got it wrong. We didn't have not have a magnitude 9 earthquake in the Japan trench. Uh, then, then the second thing is that internal consistency. If I use exactly the same loss estimation model for the real-time event and what's how it's done for the probabilistic model, what internal consistency do we see there? Uh, and that leads to are the SSEs, the similar stochastic events, fit for purpose? Uh, that's also challenging. Oftentimes, you may not have enough samples. Your model might be okay, but you may not have enough samples in the stochastic catalog. Uh, sometimes it might lead to a deficiency of the model. In this case, we would I would say that we were reasonably pleased, uh, especially with the Southeast Anatolian fault uh, scenario, the main event. And uh, for uh, the initial loss estimates, we had insured loss estimates up to four billion dollars U.S. dollars, uh, which is kind of in line. I think uh, Nilesh talked about perils. Is now talking about the low force. Our sister company, PCS, stands for Property uh, Claim Services. Uh, they have also now recently estimated, and they are also talking north of $4 billion. This is, of course, the residential losses from DCIP, plus all the non-residential losses. And I'm told that there are complexities. There are specialty lines. Uh, there are marine lines, which are complex risks, and it takes a while for the claims to settle. Uh, if not one year, there are events where it can go well beyond a year. Uh, but all indications are it's pointing to north of 4 billion. I have been informally told by some industry experts that it could reach $5 billion of total insured loss. That's my last slide. Thank you very much for your uh, for this opportunity. I would like to thank John Schneider and Jem for inviting me to speak to you. And again, apologies that I couldn't be there in person. Over to you. Thank you very much, Frank. You. Um, yeah, with that, I would ask maybe Kramer to give a bit an insight of how the. Oh, I'm sorry, I think <laughs> we have a surplus of microphones. Okay. All right. okay, so uh, thank you for having me here. Um, can you hear me or? Uh, so, quick presentation overview of the of how the Joint Mission Center of the European Commission saw these earthquakes and uh, what we did. So, for us, the uh, main goal is to support uh, humanitarian civil protection response. One of our projects at the GRC is this Global Disaster Alert and Coordination System (GDAX). It's existed for 19 years. It's a collaboration between the European Commission and uh, the United Nations with three pillars to follow. Uh, 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 to follow the the disaster and part, particularly the the information gathering about the disaster uh, from the moment that it strikes. So, as the GRC are responsible for the multi-hazard early warning system part of it, UN OCHA handles the virtual OSOC, which is a space for exchange of information between uh, operatives on the field, 
uh, humanitarian bodies that may be wanting to mobilize. And finally, uh, UNOSAT manages the satellite mapping coordination system to ensure that we make the best possible use of resources, specifically satellites are going to be flying over the area to try to map and retrieve information about the disaster. Everybody has to know what the others are doing so that we, with the same resources, we get the most coverage and the most information. How it works during the disaster, during uh, during the Turkey and Syria, uh, Syria earthquakes. First, uh, the wake up call from us at GDAX uh, multi hazard early warning system. So, immediately, a couple of minutes after we had hit, we had sent out the red alerts, which means in GDAX, red alert means local capacities are likely to be overwhelmed and outside humanitarian aid is likely to be necessary. Uh, operational coordination immediately had begun within the uh, within the virtual OSOC. Uh, uh, people in the field, uh, uh, the UN was mobilizing to uh, to, uh, to, uh, to go on site, and the exchange information was happening. This is one of the points where modeling can have a role, and I think I'll, maybe we'll touch about that more on during the discussion. And uh, the, sat the the first satellite information was already being gathered, like the requests to uh, to gather were uh, were put out, and the maps were being entered very quickly. Like we try, like from the point of. Uh, of our request, usually uh, our, uh, our, the maps need to be ready within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, and finally, looking into the longer term of the crisis, so more into the process as an assessment and reconstruction, we have uh, we ended up making a small contribution to the terror report, uh, specifically in terms of uh, debris estimation and recommendations on uh, how to accompany the, the reconstruction process. In parallel to this, at the DRC, we're trying to make as much sense of the crisis as possible by uh, using, uh, 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 making the most of the fact that we are a multidisciplinary research center. So for those of you who don't know, the Joint Research Center uh, provides scientific support and scientific information to European policies, a science or policy body. So both in the assessing what, uh, uh, how good a policy is, uh, it might be, the need for a policy, but also assessing its impacts as it after it is implemented. So again, 6th of February, we immediately had our first initial report. What, what do we know and what can we know about disaster? More reports followed over the times. Maps, I will, I will show you a couple uh, in a bit, were being made to represent the disaster map, who was doing what, and specifically also how was Europe helping to uh, deal with the disaster. And finally, uh, the uh, contribution to the terror report, like I said, on just trying to see externally what could be the path forward, the path out of this disaster for for, for Turkey. Uh, so at the bottom, you have uh, just a big, big list of all the different aspects we're trying to cover. So uh, not just uh, impact on buildings, but also on infrastructures. <laughs> Uh, health system capacity. We the, uh, the earthquake didn't happen on its own. It happened in a time when already there was like potential a uh, potential impact of drought, which could complicate the situation further. Uh, affected dams had a. We we had some questions about uh, what was going on with these dams. Like we said, in the end, it was not, it was not, uh, it was not an issue. It was just a controlled water release. We were monitoring this as well. What was being said on social media? Where was there were this information narratives? Being spread on social media, so just trying to cover the whole spread of uh, what was going on with the disaster. My final slide, not to worry you too much. So, just a couple of the maps that we made over the course of the capacity of, over the course of the disaster. So, the first one came out, I think, on the same day of the disaster, on the sixth. The final one came out, uh, just came out, at, uh, well, just uh, on, it came out at the end, at the end of April, beginning of May. Uh, some of you may recognize the insets in the top uh, left of the bottom right map. Uh, and uh, again, mapping what was going on from a humanitarian perspective and from a civil protection perspective. Where were the needs? What was being deployed? What was being done to uh, help with the disaster? In this, for us, uh, impact modeling, uh, earthquake modeling, for us, it's a way to try to anticipate what is going to be needed from us. Uh, it's a way to make sure to see, okay, there's data that's emerging from, from the field. Can we expect it to get bigger? How much bigger is it going to get? And so, and also uh, in, this, in this part, I think I have to echo part of what uh, uh, Professor Erdig said before, that uh, the distributions in damage that were being published by different media with their own in-house modeling, but we're also getting even from GEM uh, 
some uh, some replica ones didn't quite line up with what was happening. I mean, a lot of the models were very shy. Also, like in the terms of like we've had two pretty strong earthquakes one after the other, and so I think they are difficult to put together and so on. But uh, um, it was a nice first attempt on this uh, on the side to just make the most of the information, but. Uh, Again, for a host of reasons that I think were outlined quite well before, it, it didn't quite get there. Right? It was a nice try, but it didn't quite get there. Then on the other side, uh, I think that I wanted to comment on was just to try to anticipate uh, policy decisions. Uh, a lot of the modeling that we had, things like the affair project and so on, uh, had gone quite into that length into this percentage of damage or this damage state equals to then these losses because it can be repaired because it's only this percentage of the building that is damaged. The policy decision made by the Turkish government that we can see has been a lot of these buildings, despite moderate uh, damage rates, are going to be demolished. And that's, that's more information that I have, I have which equates to 100% in loss, which also means, in a, in a force, it means that it becomes even more critical to know this is the this is the threshold that we're in percentage of buildings. Are going to be demolished and why are they being demolished is it just a lack of confidence in the buildings is it a social issue that people would not feel confident living again in a building that has suffered or not that they have seen partially destroyed is it a lack of uh, training or resources locally to uh, conduct uh, these repairs and these are things that we would like to explore in the future but uh, for now uh, 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 we're start, we're at the beginning of the process. So uh, the the funding is still being put together and uh, and we'll see where the where the reconstruction process go. Copernicus uh, has uh, already been seen as a way to monitor this uh, the reconstruction process. So hopefully we'll have more about this to say uh, in, uh, in in coming months. Um, thank you very much. Um, we've run Quite a bit over time, but I think we can do a few questions if you allow. You're the session. <laughs> Two questions. Can I just say one for the panel? Of course. <laughs> <'Cause> I... <laughs> All right. Uh, what are the, I mean, difficulties I faced as a person, as a modeler uh, during these uh, events? Firstly, we were a new, newly established company and we wanted to give a very good feedback uh, to TCIP uh, executives, the directors, the general directors and everybody. So we wanted to have a good feedback because they wanted to know the level of uh, the amount of money they would be uh, paying so the, they have to secure the cash flow. So this was one of the objectives of our study. The second one, the, the advantage, my advantage was that uh, we approached the problem in a different way. We tried to simulate the, grand, the Kahraman Maraj events, those events we tried to simulate. And we were sort of well equipped in terms of simulating a single event, because before that we worked on other individual earthquakes like the Samos uh, Izmir earthquake. Uh, the Gölyak earthquake happened two or three months before the Karaman Maraş events. We worked on with Professor Ardik the uh, Marmara Sea earthquake scenarios and so, so forth. So in that sense, we were quite uh, well equipped. And the other thing is because I was local, I'm a, I'm a local guy, I knew where to go in terms of data, for example, and in terms of collaborating with colleagues in the fields of seismology, in the fields of earthquake engineering and so forth. The numbers I showed was, we're only aiming to give an overall trend for the managing people to uh, secure the cash flow during their payouts. Now that's that's it. My experience. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for 
two questions. Yeah, it's just a very good question for, well, maybe not very quick, but but Professor Erdik, thank you very much for the intervention. Super interesting. You know, some of the things you were you were uh, describing uh, was also some of the questions that we had when we were trying to evaluate this event. So just very quickly, you mentioned that uh, there were some identical damage patterns between now this event and also, for example, the ones in 1999. So the first part is, do you think, for example, um, there might be similar issues in other parts of Turkey. Uh, because, for example, I also talked with a lot of my colleagues uh, from Turkey, and they said that perhaps uh, some of the issues with the construction that we've seen on this event could be a little bit typical from this. Uh, Turkey is a very big country, so um, could be quite typical to this region. Uh, that was just one part of the question. And, um, and I forgot the other part. <laughs> Oh, sorry. It was about the fatality. Sorry. I was just going to say um, that. The, um, the, the first part is quite yeah. difficult. Anyway, I'll try to answer that thing. I mean, it, it all depends on the level of ground motion. Now, in this earthquake, there were, you know, well, the, the fault surfaces didn't slip for a long time. There were less asperities. So that means that stress drop by heart and the ground motions were very high. So ground motions were about three or four Three or three times at least of that 1919 earthquake, and then the faults were just direct on the city. So, if you case of Istanbul, the, the average distance of the fault is close to about 20 kilometers, and the the fault has been active once every 200 years. So we don't expect so high ground motion. So, the structures are brittle, meaning that they are being brittle structures. When the ground motion leaves certain level, they are gone. Okay. That's the reason that you don't have much of intermediate damage. So I think the, the similar things can repeat itself if the ground motion levels are the same. You know, you cannot talk independent of the ground motion levels. So my, I mean, out of all those questions, whether the same thing will repeat in Istanbul or not, I said, no, it will not repeat. My, that's my assessment. Thank you very much. Can I just add one thing, one point to Professor Ardik's response? I mean, I worked in the field, on the field as well, when I started this prof profession. So I went to, in 1998, Jehan earthquake. I went to then the 1999 earthquakes to the, I mean, as a young engineer, tried to assess the building structure and so forth. The one of the most difficult uh, cases in assessing structural damage is moderate damage. It's very difficult because there is a gray area and you need to be very careful and you need to be very well experienced. You need to be very well experienced in assessing moderate damage. That's that's why, uh, I mean, the, that statistics to me, uh, uh, you, you need to rework on them again and again. And in terms of policy payments, payouts, there are other issues. Can we, one more? Are we allowed one more or one? No, I don't know if it's working. Is it working? Here it is. Thank you so much for these presentations. But I was also wondering if um, you could share anything particularly about Syria um, and whether given all the expertise that exists in Turkey, whether You've actually done assessments in Syria, what the conditions are in Syria as it relates to Turkey. Are people, have people been displaced into Turkey from Syria um, or anything else that you could say about Syria just of interest? Well, I mean, I have the microphone, I guess. The, <laughs> the, I, I was in Syria about 10 years ago. I know that the building types are even much worse than that is in Turkey. So I would believe that for the, I mean, if the structures were the same, probably damage would have been even less because they there were no fault rupture there. What they get is just the, the marginal data, but even with that, they had huge damage, especially one dam in Afrin Dam is totally collapsed. And, and the things are even, you know, I mean, it's difficult to compare the damages because the ground motions are not the same, but that's all I can say at this stage. Yeah. Um, Specifically, no. The we divided the the work, uh, particularly in the satellite monitoring. It was UNOSAT who handled the Syria side, so there's really not much that I can say on that. I'm afraid. 
Sorry, with that, I think we, we do have to close this session, but I think you're still available over, it's not a coffee break. No, then later in the coffee break, you will be available for one-to-ones. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, panelists. Um, the, for those online, you can submit your questions and we can kind of take them slightly later. For now, we're going to crack on to the last little bit. You're, you're, you're 10 minutes away from coffee. Um, so what we're going to, I'd like to invite all of the people who've got either a poster or a demo to come up and I'll talk through. So Kata, so Catalina, Jochen, Danassas, Shubarup, um, what we got, Chris, Jamal, Andy, Marco, Paul and Maleka, if you could come up. And I'm only going to give you 30 seconds now. You were, you were promised a minute and we've lied to you. You're only going to get 30 seconds. So in whatever order you wish, well, actually, let's see. Uh, just come up, say who you are, say you are, and sell, sell your wares for 30 seconds. You can. Okay. That's the way it goes. Um, Paul, should I give this to you then and use that mic? Or oh, yeah. Let's, let's just, do that. Let's do this. We'll just do a round robin and then you can go. Thanks, Ian. Hi, I'm Malika Almi of the Geological Survey of Canada. And tomorrow we'll, we'll hear from my colleague Tegan Hobbs on the development and results of Canada's National Earthquake Risk Assessment Model, developed in partnership with GEM. But the demonstration will share the platform that we developed to provide some of this work and an indicator framework. Um, geared towards emergency managers and planners. It's riskprofile.ca, and it allows users to explore earthquake scenarios and probable risk at the neighborhood scale across Canada. So you can dig in and interrogate which building types are driving damage and where absolute losses and relative risk is highest, and the difference the retrofits might make for a, a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, so across the spectrum of economic, physical, and health indicators, users can geospatially visualize results and download data in their jurisdiction to make evidence-based risk reduction decisions. So this is the first iteration of the platform, and we look forward to getting input um, and improving as we move forward. So riskprofile.ca. Thank you. Fantastic, job. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Jochen Wessner. I'm from Moody's RMS. Um, we have put a poster together to look at the basics of seismicity again and what machine learning can tell us about how we classify and decluster uh, seismicity catalogs. Please come and see me at the poster. Uh, Hi, I'm uh, Shubhrup Ghosh from ImageCat. Uh, understanding the longer term impacts, economic impacts of disasters is uh, really critical for uh, government agencies, emergency managers, and insurance companies in order to develop strategies for response mitigation and uh, recovery. Uh, our poster is on the Global uh, Economic Disruption Index, or the JEDI, like the Star Wars, in uh, multi-hazard disaster response. Uh, what catastrophe models are really good at is they provide answers for the direct damage, but it's really not suitable for uh, capturing uh, the, the total cost of disaster for economic recovery. So we are bringing together Earth observation, uh, catastrophe modeling, and economic modeling to uh, present a novel approach uh, to this problem of economic disruption. So please come see our poster in that room. Thanks, Shubharup. And yeah, I thought for a minute you were going to forget the title of your poster there. So that was good. Next, please. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Alejandro Calderon. I actually work in the risk team of the of the GEM Global uh, Earthquake Model Foundation. I put together uh, with Catalina, Jeffes, and Jeff a poster about our uh, Trek initiative. It's a it's a this is um, a project that we had together with the support of USAID. It was two years long, and uh, we finished it in in 2022. And um, we would like to show you about the main components of that project. It had three main components: uh, communication, communication training and also urban risk assessment. So if you would like to learn more, for example, we worked a lot together with, with Kisher, who is here in USGS, uh, in actually modeling uh, risk at, a, at an urban environment, at an urban level, in three cities in Latin America, so Quito, Santiago de los Caballeros, and, and Cali. So if you would like to learn more, uh, please look for me, Kata. You can even ask Kisher about these things, and I will be happy to, to show you about the project and walk you through it. Fantastic, thank you. And sorry for calling you Catalina. <laughs> Please. 
Hello, everybody. My name is Andy Thompson. I'm the founder of Safe Hub. That's Safe Hub. We provide low cost sensor, um, low cost, easy to install sensor based uh, damage information for earthquakes. We provide that at the um, that damage information at both the building specific level, but also we enhance regional damage information based upon denser sensor networks. The applications for this are both situational awareness to support disaster response and recovery at the building specific level, and also the triggering of parametric insurance policies. Thank you. Uh, there's a little, the, the smallest shake table in the world is, um, is that way. Fantastic, thank you. And just to highlight, the posters I should have said are through there and the demos are around the corner in that little room there. So yeah, next thanks, that Chris. Those of you that know me know 30 seconds is impossible. Stop. So, <laughs> we'll go for 35. <laughs> I'm Christopher Burton. I'm a professor of geographic information sciences at UConn, and I'm the formal social, former social vulnerability coordinator here at GEM. Uh, the poster that we're going to demonstrate uh, essentially showcases two things. It showcases the improvement of a current GEM tool, which is the Integrated Risk Management Toolkit, and work towards that. And also the use of a GEM tool, which is the Resilience Performance Scorecard for a hazard that's not an earthquake, uh, but rather a tropical cyclone risk uh, exacerbated by sea level rise. So the Integrated Risk Modeling Toolkit, we're asking the question, this tool was developed to essentially integrate physical risk assessments with social and economic issues, uh, specifically social vulnerability. So this project is aimed at essentially asking exactly how we do that. How do we best combine the two different data types for communication to stakeholders? The second panel, which is funded by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency or Administration of the United States, is looking at essentially risk and resilience to tropical cyclones and doing it more from a bottom-up qualitative perspective. So using a scorecard, we essentially developed this with conjunction of the city of Biloxi and also with various chambers of commerce to look at business resilience. And we developed the scorecard and had it sent out to nearly 5,500 businesses along the Mississippi and Alabama coast, got about a 25% response rate to really understand what industry types are essentially less or more resilient and why. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Jamal. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Jamal Dabik. I am assistant professor at Al Najah National University, Palestine and also a researcher at the Center Foundation. Uh, in the, the demo is about a web-based map platform uh, that was developed by Jim Foundation. We used it in a project uh, to host uh, the results of uh, a national multi-hazard risk assessment, mainly including exposure, hazard, vulnerability, and risk maps. It's not only about earthquakes, it also includes uh, all types of geophysical hazards as well as climatological hazards. Uh, in this project also, we are working closely with the government. So this platform now it's owned by the government. So it's not about only raising awareness to public uh, like a typical project, but also the government is heavily involved in providing data as well through the different ministries. So this is in brief. If you are interested to know how we deploy the, the GEM technologies, uh, I'm happy to go over this with you in the demonstration session. Thank you. Thanks, Jamal. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Marco and I'm a co-founder of MHS City Lab and uh, MHS uh, Global Impact now. I'm here because I'm going to present to you the effort that we did over the last few years. And uh, really, when we set up our social venture, the, we were focusing on housing, we were focusing on uh, uh, rapidly growing countries, and uh, the question was really how to make a difference. And so... Today, I'm going to present uh, uh, for who's interested the way that we found uh, and that we are developing also with the help of GEM to basically bring from the cloud of information and nice modeling that we all uh, are aware of and we present some pragmatic cloud. How can we bring, bring this information on how to build safe to low income community? Because today we have half of the world living in city and uh, I think a quarter of this is living in informal settlements. So over a billion people basically is left alone by the, the governments and the private sector to build. So 
I think we should try to find a way to collaborate on this, and I will present this later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thanasus. Hi, everyone. I'm Athanasius Gimbrixis. I work as a catastrophe model developer for Aeon Impact Forecasting. And today in the poster, I will demonstrate some general things about the catastrophe models, what is the general anatomy of a catastrophe model, and some general framework of how we develop uh, models in the earthquake team. And then I will talk about our collaborations with academia and research institutes, with particular emphasis on our powerful collaboration with GEM for our latest uh, series for the models uh, in Canada, EMEA and APAC regions. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, standing between you and Copy is Paul. Hello, everyone. I'm Paul Henshaw, Director of Technology and Development at the GEM Foundation. The GEM IT team will be demonstrating our interactive versions of the new global hazard and risk maps and the technology that we've used to make those interactive maps um, and some of the other applications that we've we've used this software for, including uh, Jamal's uh, uh, Palestine project. So uh, we're just around the corner on your left, leaving, leaving the room, please come and see us. Thank you. So it's, um, so it's coffee now, where is coffee? That's what I was just asking. Straight at the back? Is it? Okay, so coffee's at the back. Just smell it. Follow the smell. Thank you. 
<laughs> Is everything okay? So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think I only have one slide that I need to go to the only thing. Yeah. I will also, uh, yeah, I will ask also for them. But to think with the microphone, Kat, did you see what happened with Jai, man? But we speak very efficient. We should try. Yeah, I'm changing the button.
Sì, sì, prova, sì. Scusi, era lei che voleva il microfono. Però se parlate dal podio è meglio parlare con lei. Però se altre possiamo parlare, io non va bene. Così alto si deve... Ups, Posso? Allo? Allo? Pronto? Ah, no, no. No, è molto... Eh, va bene il buon... Sì. Ah, no. Si può parlare, ma così... Sì, no, meglio... Aspetta. Il problema è che lei dovrebbe avere la camicia. Okay. Grazie, sì. Allo? C'è il gelato. C'è il gelato. Ah sì, anche il gelato potrebbe funzionare. Cioè, Come questo qua va bene per i bambini? Perché, perché se lei lo mette qua, mi sente? Sì, prova, prova. Eh? Va bene. Se non c'è il gelato, questi. Sì, sì. Sì, questo meglio, no? Sì, quello. E ti muovi di là. No, può fare una cosa di più. E anche tra le quattro lì. Se tu ti stavo a dire, vanno con la cosa che ti dico. Sì, ma sono batterie. Eh, queste, anche queste sono batterie che non vanno. Che durano. Non lo fai vedere. Non saranno meno, ma. Penso che ve l'hanno appoggiato invece, non erano tre i microfoni. Sì, sì, eh, non so, sì, c'è il comando lì, sì. Sì, grazie mille. Adesso funziona molto meglio. Le batterie, quelle nuove, sono dentro qua.
Hi, I'm Claudia. I'm a Hi, everybody. I know that coffee is good, but I'm going to need to ask you to take your seats. Marco? Yeah, we will start presenting to an empty audience. Yeah. <laughs> good? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I already put on the desktop. Can you make sure that it doesn't look wrong? It's it's already here. Yeah. Okay. Just let me see. Uh, that? What did happen? You went to. Is that what you wanted to do? I mean, I. I what is that? I don't know what you've just done, but is it? A, do you want to go full screen? Full screen or over there? Okay. So. Why pretty much same thing. <laughs> You're just making Sorry. it. Yes. So to go to, is it command? Yeah. Oh, no. Uh, yep, there you go. Okay, so it works over there. Uh, we have here Marco. Let's just see. Let's just see if this is working. It is working. Okay. Look at the look. Okay. When I when I start to, I'm going to introduce you. Thank you. Yeah, you go. Is that okay? Absolutely. It's okay. You don't have to move. You can stand right next to me. <laughs> it's all right. But I didn't know you were going to start right in. But I have to introduce you. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, everyone will get mad at me. <laughs> Hi, John. Good to see you. Good luck. Great to like you. Really. Don't really. Break Sorry? A leg. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, you said break a leg. It's a break a leg. Oh, yeah, sure. I know that. I've got it. it. I don't recommend it. I was just going to say, is this your way of like passing on the torch to people? I'll pass on that. Good fortune. 
All right, everyone, please have a seat. We're starting in 30 seconds, whether you like it or not. Take your seats. I don't know any, eh? All right, everyone, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, session one following our introductory session. So if you can please uh, grab your copies, join your, take a seat. Uh, so following on our introductory session this morning, uh, the next uh, session, which will take us till just after five o'clock, is a focus on uh, the global hazard and risk models. Echo. There's an echo. It's there? Okay. okay. Um, and so to kick us off, we have Marco Pagani. And uh, Marco is the manager for the hazards team. He's been with GEM since 2010. That puts us up to 13 years, doesn't it, Marco? Uh, Marco has over 20 years experience in seismic hazard analysis, and he has led the development of the global um, hazard model. And he's got some slides to share with us. And this is quite a monumentous occasion after the last release in 2018. So congratulations in advance to your team. And I turn it over to you, Marco. Thank you very much, Sonia, and good afternoon to everyone, and welcome to my city. So I'm, this is my hometown. I hope you will have a chance to visit the upper part, which is the best one. Um, so today I'm going to give you, as Sonia explained, an update on the work that we've been doing to, um, on, the, on the collection of models that uh, we have uh, for computing hazard at the global scale. So uh, as you can imagine, this is an effort uh, that is carried out uh, at the team level. So here you have sorry, the list of all the members of the other team uh, since uh, uh, 2019. And I want also to recognize uh, the very important contribution and help uh, that we receive from the IT team and in particular from Michele. So when we speak about uh, uh, the global model, the GEM global model, um, of course, uh, we need to start from what we call the mosaic. So the mosaic is a collection of models that all, if you put them all together, they are giving us the possibility of calculating the hazard at the global scale. And you can see here some of them. The first set of models that, uh, the first version of this uh, global collection of models uh, was released in 2018. And we've been trying to, to regularly keep that updated until this release. Uh, uh, this mosaic, it's needless to say that for us is extremely important and most of our activities are actually going around that because it's really the core of what we do in the other team at GEM. The mosaic, of course, is not the only approach that we have for calculating the hazard at the global scale. The other extreme would be to uh, create uh, homogeneous data sets at the global scale. So an earthquake catalog, an active fault catalog, uh, maybe a, a database of subduction uh, sources. But we, in, our, in our opinion, the mosaic approach has a number of, of advantages compared to the, uh, to the other approach that I was explaining. One of them is that uh, with the mosaic, we are able to represent in every area of the world, the best science that is available, at least to our knowledge. The second one is, is uh, that um, in this way, we are able to always provide, an, or very often uh, able to provide an hazard that is reflecting not just uh, the gem view, but, but very often a collective view, because when it's possible, indeed in the mosaic, we are incorporating models that are coming from the community. Uh, the mosaic, in our opinion, is also the best approach when you need to calculate risk afterwards. And it's uh, the best way uh, to promote also best practice uh, and to appraise uh, the state of the art uh, of what is done for computing the hazard at the global scale. Of course, the main disadvantage is that uh, the models are not uh, homogeneous. Uh, they are heterogeneous, uh, so they are developed 
uh, with data sets that are varying from, a, from area to area with methods that are varying. And that's, uh, to a certain extent, uh, of course, a negative point, but it, it can be also considered a positive point because only in some areas uh, it's possible to apply certain type of methodologies. In terms of the way in which uh, we are collecting the models, uh, what we do is to follow uh, a, a multi-tier approach. Uh, this is uh, uh, the same concept that, by the way, has been presented already in 2018. And what we do here is to, uh, in a decreasing, uh, let's say, order of preference, uh, look for a certain area if a model is, uh, is available. It has been developed either for a well from a well-recognized uh, national agency or from a large uh, international project. If that model is not available, we look into the literature and we try to find models that are available in literature. And if then uh, uh, also that option is not uh, available, what we do is to develop a model internally. The trade union, so the, the, the common point between all the models that are in the mosaic is the open quick engine because they are all represented with the same format, which is the input format for the open quick engine. And this is, a, this is the mosaic as of today. So uh, right now the, the mosaic includes uh, 30 models uh, all together. And, uh, and uh, compared to what we uh, released in 2018, there are three main areas in which uh, we introduced some changes uh, that I will explain more extensively later on. The first area in which we introduce changes uh, is the model for the United States. Now we have a single model rather than a model for uh, uh, California and a model for the rest of the conterminous part of the US. Then we have a new model for Greenland that was not included in the, in the 2018 version. And that's a model that has been contributed uh, by FN Global, so our colleagues from FN Global. And the third change uh, is in Europe, uh, because in Europe now we decided to incorporate also Turkey, and whereas in the 2018 model, Turkey was covered by the Middle East model. This might change in the future, by the way, because there are activities going on in the Middle East right now. From a physical point of view, uh, the mosaic is, uh, is actually collected in a, in a version control system. So every model, Every version of the model is, uh, is cataloged, is stored there. And uh, in that system, we also have the possibility of constantly running all the models against uh, the OpenQuake engine in order to always have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the capabilities that are in the OpenQuake engine and the models that we have in our mosaic collection. So to explain now the changes that we've been introducing uh, in this new version, I subdivided them in three categories, and I will go through each category to explain what we've been doing. So starting, of course, from the models, and in that case, the changes are either in terms of improvements that we did on existing models, or uh, we, cases in which instead we've been replacing a, a former version of a model with a new one. And, uh, and in that respect, uh, this is the situation that we had uh, back, uh, back in 2018. So as you can see, we had a majority of models that were developed within uh, um, regional or national uh, uh, initiatives. And these are the models that are here representing in this light brown color. We had one model that we took uh, from literature or a contributed, let's say, model, because it's a model developed by Nat and Thin Bajan and implemented in the OpenQuick engine by, by uh, a person that now is working in Natural Resources, resources Canada, Nick Ackerley. And then we have uh, three models uh, that were developed by GEM within uh, regional initiatives, uh, and a few models, the ones that you see here with this uh, light hash pattern, that are models that we developed internally at GEM. In this new version, we are adding, as I said, uh, this new model for Greenland, and we've been replacing the model for China, that was originally a model developed by uh, the China Earthquake Administration with an internally developed model. And we had to do that because, uh, unfortunately, we never managed to come to an agreement with uh, uh, the China Earthquake Administration to share the model. And so we had to basically replace it. 
if we look at the changes that we introduced in terms of, uh, let's say, as I was explaining, either replacement of a model or change inside the model, this is a map that is giving you a summary of what we've been doing. So in pink, you see the models that have been completely replaced by new versions. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in blue, you see models where we've been changing the gram motion component uh, in most of the cases by uh, replacing all the versions of a gram motion model or a number of gram motion models with new, newer versions that meanwhile were published. And uh, in the case of the model for uh, Central America and the Caribbean and the model for so uh, South America that you see here, um, what we did here was to uh, introduce some changes, some improvements, hopefully, to the seismic source characterization component as well as to the ground motion characterization component. Uh, if we look at, let's say, more at detail of the changes we've been doing, uh, so in Canada, what we did was to replace the 2050 model with the 2020 version. That, um, in the United States, uh, as I as I explained, uh, we uh, we uh, merged the user-free model with a uh, part of the model that is covering the conterminus part into a single one, and we replaced the 2014 version with the 2018 version. In Europe, we replaced the SHN 13 with the SHN 20. In the Philippines, uh, we, we updated the model for the Philippines uh, within a collaboration with Fivolx. For Papua New Guinea, we replaced uh, the previous version that was developed in a collaboration between Geoscience Australia and, uh, and researchers working in the uh, Geophysical Observatory at Port Moresby. Uh, we updated the model for the Pacific Islands. We added the 2020 model for Taiwan. We added the 2021 model for Japan from NID. And uh, uh, we, we uh, added two new models, uh, the one that I was already explained to you uh, for China, and uh, a, a similar model uh, developed with similar methodologies uh, for Korea. If we look at epistemic uncertainty, which is a, a, a component in the other modeling that uh, is obviously extremely important, uh, the situation between 2018 and 2000 and the version that I'm, uh, I'm presenting today didn't change much. We, we have, of course, uh, uh, most of the models already incorporating in some way uncertainties in the seismic source characterization as well as in the ground motion characterization. We improved that just a little bit because uh, the, China, the new China model in, is indeed incorporating epistemic uncertainty for both the components. Uh, but as you can see, there are still a number of models that are not uh, incorporating epistemic uncertainties, and we wish we want to, to improve uh, in the next uh, few years. Uh, there are also a couple of models that unfortunately are not uh, uh, including epistemic uncertainties, but I guess that this will change also in the near future. So to implement all these changes, of course, uh, we had to work quite a bit on the methodological side. And here I'm just giving you some examples of the improvements at the methodological level that we've been doing. The first one was a complete refactoring of, uh, of the way in which we are modeling multifold uh, sources. Uh, this is becoming more and more important. Sorry, we, you, we, you saw, for example, the presentation regarding the, the Turkey earthquake. So uh, having the capability of modeling that level of complexity is extremely, extremely key right now in order to have reliable models. So because of that, uh, we rewrote completely the way in which we are modeling this type of sources, and we develop a source typology that can be combined with all the other source typologies that we have in the OpenQuake engine, which is not something that was possible with the previous implementation. So with this new source typology, we implemented user-free entirely. And as I explained, we combine user-free with the uh, model for the conterminus part. The second uh, methodological improvement was the way in which we are building models, uh, building the full component, uh, the active, uh, uh, shallow crust full component uh, of our models. Uh. And the traditional methodology that we've been using up until the China model uh, included these phases. So one phase in which we were collecting information from uh, public databases, from literature, and we were using that information in order to define uh, 
an average trip rate on every fault in a certain area. And using that information and taking uh, as in a priori assumption a, a segmentation, so a subdivision of the different segments uh, in the full system, we were characterizing the, the faults. Uh, um, with the construction of the uh, China model, we decided to uh, abandon this approach uh, and in particular to remove uh, this component that was quite subjective in which we are defining the sleep rate. So, and, so we removed that and replaced that with the construction of a block model. So the block model is, is, a, is a, a kinematic model. So a model that is taking as an input the definitional number of blocks, is taking information from GNSS systems, and is combining all this information into a big inversion that is capable to define the sleep rates on all the faults that are bordering the blocks. Okay. Using this information, um, in the case of China, then what we decided to do was to take uh, the, the sleep rates on the different faults uh, and to use a methodology that is similar to the one that has been used in California for developing the user free, in which we are not taking uh, an a priori assumption on the segmentation. And we are giving the possibility the faults uh, to combine together in multifold structures. Uh, so that's the way in which, uh, starting from the China model, we uh, improved our capabilities of modeling shallow cross faults. A third methodological development uh, that I want to mention is about model evaluation. So during the last year, we developed a, a code, so a package that is called AMLET, uh, which is the acronym of Hazard Model Evaluation and Testing. And this is a tool in which we have a number of, uh, of methods that are usually uh, used in the statistical seismology community. And we use uh, those tools uh, not uh, so much for testing the models uh, after, they are complete, after they are completed, but rather to, uh, let's say, test why we develop the model in order to improve it, in order to come up with a solution that is the one that is better representing the information that we have at hand. So in this case, I'm showing you a very simple example in which we apply this type of methodology for the Pacific Islands. In the Pacific Islands, we have a number of uh, uh, subduction sources uh, affected, of course, by a lot of epistemic uncertainty because they are remote areas in which information is not uh, uh, extremely complete. So here you can see the different uh, uh, logic trees uh, that we created for subduction in slab and subduction interface sources. Uh, these uncertainties, of course, uh, when, you, uh, when you put them into the uh, model building process uh, are leading, for example, to different uh, mind to frequency distributions, uh, different distributions uh, in space of the seismicity. And so in order to come up uh, with a, a, a decisions about, for example, the weights uh, that we assign to the different uh, uh, interpretations that are included in the logic tree, what we decided to do is to use a number of tests and to check the way in which every hypothesis was performing against the observations that we had. And using this process, uh, we came up with a way to define the weights that is a bit less subjective than the one that otherwise we would use. Moving to the second category, which is about the hazard calculation. In this case, uh, we focused on three components. Uh, one is about uh, the definition of the horizontal component of motion. In the 2018 model, we did an homogenize the way in which the horizontal component is represented. In this case, we implemented in the open quick engine uh, conversion, empirical conversion equations. Uh, and now we are providing an, an other results, other results that are all represented in terms of the geometric mean. The other two components are the truncation of ground motion and the minimum magnitude of homogenization. So for, for the truncation of the, um, of the distribution that we use to describe the aleatory uncertainty for ground motion, uh, traditionally in the past, we've been using three sigmas. So for this release, instead, in, instead of using six sigmas, we decided to move to five standard deviations because that's more in line with what you find in the, in the general literature about the topic. And um, so the impact of that is, uh, is uh, mostly on the steepest part of the other curve. And here you can see a very an idealized case study for which I'm showing you the way in which the other curve is varying by uh, if you increase uh, the standard deviation of the of, of, of truncation from one sigma to two sigmas to three sigmas, five. So 
Some changes, but let's say not dramatic, particularly for the repair periods that we are considering for our maps. The second, uh, the second change was, uh, uh, or the second improvement, uh, it was uh, on the homogenization of the magnitude mine, or minimum magnitude, uh, because in the 2018 model, uh, that's also something that we did not homogenize. Uh, here you can see one of the many versions that are available of, of the so famous hazard integral. I'm not going to describe the hazard integral, don't be scared. The only thing that, so the only reason why I put the hazard integral is because I wanted to emphasize that the hazard integral is one of the two integration limits that are used in one of the integrals. So that means that the probability of exceedance that you see when uh, uh, I'm showing you the hazard maps is controlled in some way by the minimum magnitude. And, uh, and where this is uh, changing the results, in this case instead, is uh, uh, in the part of the hazard curve that is uh, the flat part and the initial part of the hazard curve. And, and this is affecting in particular uh, uh, ground motion at high frequencies. So uh, for this part uh, and taking, uh, let's say, endorsing the philosophy uh, uh, from, uh, from a paper uh, from uh, Julian Bomer and Aaron Crowley, um, what we decided to do is to basically decide to, dis to define a value of the minimum magnitude that is tailored on the type of application, okay? Mm -hmm. And in our case, what we decided to, to do is to choose actually an extremely low value because uh, uh, if we choose four, okay, and given that that's, that's a configuration parameter, people, when we'll take our models, will be able to calculate from four up. So if, uh, if you feel that uh, four is completely meaningless for your application in the configuration file of the open quick engine, you, put, you can put five and you go. But if you think that four is important in the model, that information is available. Uh, moving to the last part, uh, which is about results. So for the results, we've been working on the grid resolution. And this is, by the way, trying to take into account uh, requests that we received uh, in the last uh, few years uh, from different users. Uh, so we increased the number of intensity measure types uh, and we also added uh, disaggregation results uh, for main cities at the moment, at least. Uh, so um, for the calculation of the other map, what we do is to use uh, a, a grid, uh, a global grid uh, that is equally spaced in distance. And we do that because that's the best way to optimize uh, calculations. Uh, uh, using an equally spaced uh, in, in latitude and longitude uh, grid uh, that would create a grid uh, super dense uh, close to the poles uh, and not sufficiently dense uh, close to the equator. Whereas in this case, uh, we are providing results uh, that more or less have the same uh, level of resolution everywhere. Um, until last year, we've been creating this global grid using internal code, and we decided to abandon that in favor of this public library that is called H3, uh, H3Geo library. And uh, we also uh, took, uh, took uh, this opportunity to, uh, to move to a grid that has a, a higher resolution than the one that we've been using in 2018. Here you have... Uh, the same area, it's area of the lakes in Lombardy, actually, and I think we are around here. So this is uh, the, um, the other map uh, computed with the previous uh, grid, and this is uh, uh, for the same area, the new map uh, that uh, will be available from, uh, from today, basically. So overall, at the global scale, uh, using this grid, uh, we are calculating hazard for about 4.5 million of points. So getting to the, uh, to the topologies of results that we are calculating, uh, right now our standard includes uh, the calculation of, of other results on reference rock, 800 meters per second, and on soil taking into account the VS30 database. We are calculating results for PGA and six uh, spectral ordinates. We calculate a uniform other spectra and other maps for two return periods and all those intensity measure types. And as I, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, we are also now calculating other disaggregation for main cities. This is the other map as we computed in, the, in 2018. And this is the new global map calculated with the new model and the new um, improvements that I described up, up until now. Uh, if we look at the difference between the two, because I know that by just looking at the maps, uh, uh, there's not much that you can grasp. 
uh, you can see that uh, the major changes are actually in China, and those are uh, explained by the replacement of the previous model that, by the way, did not incorporate directly faults uh, with, with our model. We have some changes uh, along the Himalayas uh, where we replaced uh, some ground motion models uh, um, that, uh, in our opinion, were not uh, uh, the best uh, uh, option. Uh, there are some changes in Turkey, and those are explained uh, by the change of model from uh, the uh, M model, so the model for the Middle East uh, completed in 2014-15, with a new European model that is also covering uh, Turkey. We had quite some changes in Papua New Guinea, and that's the change between the previous model from GA to the new one, uh, still from GA. We have this scattered pattern in, uh, in South America that uh, is explained by uh, changes that we've been doing in the uh, smoothing algorithm. And I must say that I'm still not very much satisfied uh, by that pattern, and we will most probably change it once we have a little bit of time. Some changes uh, um, uh, on the new Madrid, I, um, at the moment at least, uh, uh, explained by the uh, change in between the old and new model, might be also due to the Gramotion models that meanwhile had been added to the US model. Some changes at the borders uh, uh, of the user-free, and those are explained by the fact that now the two models are together and therefore they are able to exchange contributions, which is not something we had in the past and some changes in Alaska that are explained by the change in ground motion model. Um, something that we did that's also quite recent and I, to be honest, uh, still need to digest everything. This is a map showing the amplification factor. So basically it's the ratio between the PGA computed on soil over the PGA computed on rock at the global scale. Um, as I said, there are, there are a lot of things that uh, we, we did that last week. And so I cannot give you all the details, but there are already things that are extremely interesting. For example, if you look at the usual border between uh, US and Canada, it seems that the site response in Canada is, is treated slightly different than in the US. And that's also that's something interesting to, to understand better. But there will be many more things that certainly will come up out of this. Uh, as I told you, we also have uh, disaggregation results. Here you have uh, um, many points. Each point is a city, okay? And uh, for every city, I'm showing you the, the modal combination of mind to the distance that is given. So basically the combination of mind to the distance that is giving the largest contribution to a specific value of hazard. In this case, the peak ground acceleration with 2% probability of exceedance in 50 years. Uh, the larger is the, the dot, okay? The larger is the, the magnitude of that uh, uh, event. And the color instead is giving you an indication of the distance of, of that modal event. And there are interesting things here that you can also notice. For example, you can notice that uh, when you go along the subductions, but in the in uh, in South uh, sorry in Central America, the contributions are in general coming from uh, let's say moderate distances uh, and relatively large events. Uh, this is the case also if you go here in Indonesia, and to a certain extent Japan. Uh, there is of course the same case of uh, Singapore and Kuala Lumpur that are super dark because the distances there are of course extremely large and the events are also relatively large. And then there's a, there's a, a large number of, of cases in which instead uh, the, the hazard is controlled for the most uh, by events that are occurring at short distances and of relatively small magnitude. Uh, last point on, uh, on, uh, on the results is the documentation. Uh, we've been working quite a bit on documentation. Kendra actually did a, a marvelous job there. And uh, now uh, we've been replacing the documentation that it was available online uh, as, as an HTML with a, a small PDF, so a small document that is describing every model that we have in the mosaic. Um, when we presented the, the results uh, in 2018, uh, um, one of the questions that we received uh, was, uh, was the following. Okay, it's fantastic, you have this uh, mosaic, uh, 
uh, you are calculating the other maps, uh, but what else are you doing with this mosaic? So uh, it works to answer to those questions uh, or to avoid uh, uh, the, say, the same question this time. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was useful to have a couple of examples of projects in which we are currently using uh, the, the global mosaic. The first one is an internal project that is uh, uh, sponsored by Swiss Re. And in this project, we have the goal of uh, creating uh, um, uh, shaking maps, okay, or shaking scenarios for most of the events that are in the ICGEM catalog and are of a certain interest from an engineering point of view. Uh, of course, the goal is not to reinvent the wheel and we want to leverage as much as, uh, as we can from information that is already available, for example, from the USGS shake maps. But when, when uh, let's say sufficient information is not available in, in, our, in the workflow that we are currently developing, what we plan to do for a certain event is to, um, uh, when, when information is not available, we find that the corresponding other model in our mosaic, we look at the ruptures that are, let's say, the ones that in principle are able to explain that event. We, we classify from a tectonic point of view that event. We take the corresponding gram motion models from the gram motion model for that, from that other model. And if we have uh, some uh, uh, strong motion recordings, we use that in order to constrain the gram motion field and we create uh, the shaking scenario. Okay, this is information that, of course, is very important for calibration. And uh, certainly, we are willing to make sure that uh, uh, this will be coordinated and shared uh, with what Catalina is going to present to you after, uh, later today. The second project uh, is called uh, AILO, which is the acronym of AC Earthquake Loads Overseas. So this is a project that we are carrying out uh, in collaboration with the USGS and is sponsored by the Department, US Department of State and Department of Defense. So in this case, uh, the goal that we have is to calculate uh, AC 716 and 722 uh, design loads for about 500 sites uh, that are outside of US and distributed more or less globally. And, uh, and um, uh, these calculations must be performed by a system that is as much as possible automated and not in need of, uh, of uh, information beyond uh, the coordinates of the site and if you have it, a VS30 value. So the, the uh, workflow that in this case we are implementing that is still also, uh, let's say, using the mosaic, in this case, given a site, in this uh, uh, algorithm, we are selecting the reference hazard model. We are calculating probabilistic seismic hazard results. In light of that, we decide if, if it is necessary and we call in, uh, to perform a, a disaggregation by source of the hazard and in order to identify the sources that are contributing the most. Using that information, we perform a deterministic analysis and using the probabilistic results and the deterministic results, we define the design loads. So that, that uh, all this workflow is currently in, under development. And at the end of the project, uh, together with the analysis for these 500 sites, uh, we, we will also deliver a web API that, uh, as I was explaining, given the coordinates of the site and the S30 is able to give you all those, all those results automatically. Now I'm getting to the end of my presentation and uh, I'm giving you some glimpses of where we want to go. Um, so one thing that we, we are uh, considering quite seriously, also in light of developments that we are adding to the OpenQuick engine, is to uh, break the, the current uh, parts uh, that are composing the mosaic in, in smaller pieces, uh, because uh, uh, the models are becoming more and more complex, and you, it might seem as a paradox, but in order to deal with that complexity, we need to simplify the models. So we need to split them into parts in order to be able to deal with more complex models. Okay. And moreover, we see the uh, many advantages in having a structure that is, uh, let's say, uh, not, not, not dealing with these uh, bulky, very large uh, uh, models uh, instead with smaller models because uh, uh, we are able to um, 
update more easily a, a single part, a single component of the model compared to the structure that we have right now. A second aspect in, on which we are uh, planning to work is on time dependence. And we already have a project started in that regard, or let's say part of a project. It's a, a new project sponsored by USAID called Force. And inside this project, we are going to develop a time-dependent hazard model for, uh, for Central America with the focus on El Salvador. Um, another area uh, where we, we plan to work is on uh, building a, a global stochastic event set using the entire uh, uh, catalog, sorry, the entire mosaic. Here I'm showing you just an example of the procedure that we are going to apply. And I'm using this example uh, that is an analysis that we've been doing as part of a collaboration with the NGV. The goal is to develop a stochastic catalog for the Mediterranean, and in particular, actually, for this area that is within this red boundary. And if you look at that area, there are three models, okay, that you need to consider. And the models, because of the way in which until so far we've been implementing or collecting them, are not homogenized. So there are large areas where they are overlapping. So if we were to generate stochastic event sets using those models, we would double count a lot of the seismicity. So the only way to, uh, that we have at the moment to homogenize them is to define areas within which okay, we define uh, the responsibility of every model to contribute uh, to this stochastic catalog. So once we have those areas, what we can do is to generate uh, the stochastic event set uh, with all the ruptures. We can select the ones that are inside the area that is of pertinence for a certain model. We can repeat the same procedure for all the models and come up uh, with a catalog of, of events that is uh, not including double counted events and global. Uh, last couple of slides. Uh, still in terms of development, of course, uh, we are keeping an eye on, uh, on new models. We are going to incorporate the new model that will be released uh, for Alaska. There's a model that has been released in 2021 for Hawaii that we are willing to incorporate. We will be working in Central Asia. There's a very nice project right now uh, uh, just, has just started in the Middle East, uh, uh, led by uh, ETH, uh, but with a large uh, collaboration with a lot of experts from, from the region for uh, building a new model for the Middle East. And we are working with Comet in Central Asia to develop a new model. And there is, of course, uh, the, the new New Zealand model that has been just released, an extremely complex model that we require a lot of work uh, in the engine in order to incorporate that. The last slide is really work in progress. It's the second activity that we are currently uh, carrying out as part of this force project. One goal is to develop this time dependent hazard model for Central Asia. The other one is to develop hazard models for all the areas that so far were not covered by a model. So basically we want to cover all the oceans. And the goal of that is of, to provide hazard to uh, information to a lot of small communities that otherwise uh, would not be able to have that information. But also from a more, let's say, practical point of view from our side, to have a model that is able to generate all the seismicity at the global scale that we can use to compare with what we are observing. So basically, we want to have a comparison one-to-one -one between a global stochastic event set and the global seismicity that we are measuring during uh, time. Uh, last slide is, of course, uh, uh, about uh, all the organizations with which we are working. So uh, this is of, uh, something, needless to say, that is possible only thank you to your contribution. So your, uh, thanks again for your help. And uh, we, we are clearly very keen to continue working with you. Thanks very much, Marco. So I think what we'll do, we'll just take uh, one question, see if there's a question online, and then we'll go to Vitor. Sorry, Vitor. Is there any questions online? Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, there is a question online asking uh, about 
uh, basically, you mentioned the updated model calculates hazard for 4.5 million points globally. What number of points was hazard calculated for in the 2018 model? <laughs> less. less I, I think uh, the resolution is uh, more or less double. So that means one fourth. Three times. Michele is more informed than me. Okay, well, it was not that far. Wonderful. Okay, well, thank you very much, Marco. Appreciate it. Um, next up. So next we have uh, Vitor Silva, who's going to provide us with an update on the global risk model. Um, Vitor is the manager of the risk team, and he's been with GEM since 2010. He's also a professor at the University of Aveiro in Portugal. He's an accomplished earthquake risk engineer and researcher, and he has led the development of the global earthquake risk model. Vitor, all yours. Thank you, Sonia, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for coming to Bergamo or for joining us um, online. I would like to start um, the, the presentation about uh, what we did on the global seismic risk model. But before that, uh, as I was doing this presentation in the past few weeks, I thought that uh, the title was quite uh, limited. So I would like to introduce just some, um, just some quick, just some quick corrections. Because in fairness, the model is not just updating, it's also upgrading, improving. There's creation of a few uh, data sets. It's global, but yeah, it has global coverage, but there's also a lot of uh, models that are uh, national, subnational. They can go into a higher detail. We did a lot of work on the vulnerability, fragility, and exposure. It's not just a model, but it also has information about obviously data, profiles, and maps. Um, I included here directly, uh, perhaps the people that work a little bit more directly on the model, but in fairness, you know, this has been a contribution from many, many people. And um, I, I will think a lot of them throughout the presentation and also towards the end. But um, I think it is obviously fair to uh, make sure we acknowledge all these people. And also, um, as Mark finished his presentation, I actually want to mention that none of this would have been possible without the support from so many organizations that either support GEM or basically they were patient enough to uh, help us developing the models and improving the models and, and so on. And if I was a very good artist, I would have drawn the logos, um, but I'm not. So um, I'm here today to explain how we have converted the glorious mosaic uh, of hazard models that uh, Marco just presented into a view of global uh, earthquake risk. Um, I will explain how the various components have changed uh, since 2018, um, how some of the new components have been uh, generated, and finally also uh, what is still missing, and maybe some future directions that I believe um, we should all explore. Um, but before I start describing some of these components, I think it's important for us to understand that um, uh, we didn't start from, from scratch. We didn't start from, from square one. Uh, there has been four years that our first version of the global seismic risk model has been out. So uh, what lessons have we learned and how have some of these data sets, some of these models and data have been applied? So for example, uh, we were quite um, thrilled with all the interest that the, the, these models, these data sets that country profiles had when they were released in 2018. And we had thousands of downloads throughout the years of either different components of the model, or for example, the posters that were produced. Um, also something that was quite uh, interesting is that different pieces of the model were used to either develop national models for a few countries, or even going beyond that and developing um, urban models in, in places like, for example, Canada, uh, uh, Quito, um, Colombia, um, uh, and Dominican Republic, and Croatia, and so on. Uh, it was also one of the highlights in one of the global assessment reports by the United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction Office. Um, it was one of the chapters on the 2019 uh, re global report. Um, some parts of the model were used to include uh, new models into Oasis and Touchstone um, platform. Um, in case you haven't noticed, there was a global pandemic and we had this challenge initially from the Italian civil protection to try to understand how can earthquakes impact the spread of the virus? Because obviously there's um, um, a disregard of safety measures if something happens. So it was quite interesting to do this study and then to see that the World Health Organization also had a few calls with us and they included this study on their uh, platform. 
And finally, uh, also something that um, uh, we're quite proud is that different pieces of the model were used for um, capacity building, a lot of training, a lot of online training, uh, and part of this uh, activities were within the scope of the track uh, project. In addition to these applications, I've been discussing mostly in the last half a year about this release of this model and what people were looking for. In fact, some of the people that have not used different pieces of the model, I asked them specifically, you know, why? I can see that you're working on this. So what is what is it missing? So I just want to include here. Hi, I'm a project director at Lisbon Municipality. What types of disaster with metros would fit for us? For us, it will be important to have an analysis about the vulnerability of the housing function buildings, but also the cultural heritage buildings. The dependencies and the interdependencies will also be a goal for us. The infrastructure networks, not only the ones regarding the communication, the energy, the water supplies, but also in a way that considers these infrastructures as a way to evacuate and also to access the critical infrastructures. Thank you. So for the particular case of the city of Lisbon, they're quite concerned about uh, the damage in the building, the damage in the facades, and in particular, also an infrastructure risk. And tomorrow we're going to have a very interesting presentation, for example, about how we've been incorporated already the infrastructure risk um, in the open quake engine. And I will talk also a little bit about these metrics and what were the results that we have produced uh, towards this direction. Hello, my name is Drasen Steidukar. I am head of the sector for disaster risk reduction in civil protection directory, Ministry of the Interior Republic of Croatia. The earthquakes in Croatia in 2020 have undoubtedly shown the importance of reliable earthquake risk assessments. Unfortunately, we have paid for every shortcoming from the preparedness phase, but we expected that the projects currently underway will provide valuable information such as the expected number of damaged buildings for future key strategic decisions. For our risk management activities, it is important to understand the vulnerability of the building stock. And in case of the strong earthquake, it is fundamental to evaluate rapidly the number of collapses, fatalities, and injured citizens. Thank you. So for the case of the colleagues from Croatia, they, they shared um, a, 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 a huge concern about the impact more on um, the human impact. So basically fatalities, injuries, the people that would be displaced, um, because obviously a lot of these people have to be assisted. So they want to highlight places of um, high risk. So with all this feedback, uh, what have we been doing in the last four years? And I will start by the updating and upgrading of the exposure. First of all, a lot has happened since 2018. So in 2018, we had 7.6 billion in the world. Now we have, we, we already reached the mark of 8 billion people in the world. And we know that the exposures is, is, is all models indicate that we, we're going to see the population increase quite a lot to 9.2 billion just in the next 16 years. And we're going to have a presentation tomorrow as well about how should we start predicting future risk and not just current risk. So how much is that? That's another 375 million people in, in the planet. That's equivalent to the population of the United States and Canada together. Um, if we use the global average household from the United Nations, that's equivalent to another 98 million dwellings, which is um, equivalent to all the dwellings that exist currently in Indonesia and South Korea. And finally, um, if we also use the average number of people per buildings in our global model, that's equivalent to all the buildings that exist in Brazil and Argentina, at least in our model. So it's like in the last four years, we just built two very large countries. Something else that was also extremely complicated for us to manage was the massive inflation that we observed in the, in the world, um, initially due to the uh, um, global pandemic and now also exacerbated by the um, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, I checked the inflation yesterday, and 54 countries in the world still have inflation above 10%. And this is the inflation that includes all the products in the country. But if you think about inflation in the construction sector, usually it's about 25 to 50% higher than inflation at the national level. Okay? So what does this mean? It means that if you have inflation of, for example, 14% during four years, the costs double. So whatever costs, let's say $100 in 2017, now would cost $200. Uh, um, uh, and for countries like Germany, the Netherlands, or the United States, a lot of the data that we collected, and we saw very interesting um, 
articles from view risk, uh, the inflation has been above 10% for several years. So this was also something that we had to incorporate on the model, but it's almost like a moving target. Every time we update the model, the costs have increased by the time that we do it. But we also have some adjustments on the model that go in the opposite direction. So having less value and having less buildings. This was partially done by basically studying how the non-residential assets um, uh, work in some countries, for example, in Southeast Asia. A lot of the businesses are, are um, uh, performed from private households. So in 2017, we just assumed that a lot of this would be in dedicated buildings, would have a lot of commercial and industrial buildings in specific parts of the world. Now, a lot of these buildings have been removed because we now understand that a lot of these businesses are in residential buildings. Before I move to the presentation of the global exposure uh, um, maps, I just want to mention again that despite the fact that we have global coverage, there's um, a high detail in a lot of the models out there. For example, I'm including here the model for India, uh, currently uh, the country with the highest population in the world, and we had the data at the township level. So not just uh, high resolution in terms of the um, uh, geographical uh, resolution of the, of the data, but also in terms of the detail um, on the building uh, typologies. So after the review, updating and upgrading of the exposure model for all the countries in the world, we spatially disaggregated the residential, commercial, and industrial assets on an evenly spaced grid as presented on this global map. This is a number of buildings at the global scale, and we can see a massive concentration of human activity um, in Southeast Asia, obviously, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, a little bit in Central Europe, um, and also in East of the United States. If we think instead about replacement cost, now the distribution, the pattern, it's a little bit different. Now we have um, a, a stronger concentration of, of value uh, in the United States and Canada, Australia and New Zealand, uh, Central and North um, uh, Europe, and also um, around the east of China and Japan. Just some facts and numbers about the uh, global exposure model. The current model has 7.84 billion people, 1.5 2 billion uh, buildings, 242 billions uh, of, of square meters in terms of construction area, and a total value of 287 trillion US dollars. In comparison with the 2017 model, um, uh, we doubled the value of the exposure value um, from one side again, because of the additional buildings that we added in the model, but because of the massive increase on the construction costs uh, that we have observed. Also something that we did was to um, divide this replacement cost between structural components and unstructural components. So now we are able to say how much does the building cost? And we also added the value for the contents. This is done at the level of the building class. So we take into account that, for example, the distribution of contents and the cost of the buildings is different in an adobe or a bamboo building in comparison, for example, with a modern reinforced concrete building. In terms of the distribution of this uh, four metrics across the residential, commercial, and industrial building stock, uh, residential buildings dominate um, the exposure model right now, uh, perhaps with no big surprises. But we see that in terms of area, um, residential buildings uh, are two thirds of the model, and if sorry, uh, four fifths of the model. And in terms of the replacement cost, uh, commercial and industrial buildings represent one third of the value of the global model because um, a lot of the industrial and commercial buildings tend to have higher areas and also higher costs because of the contents. This is the ranking in terms of the number of buildings, replacement cost, and construction area of the top 15 countries. Um, um, India is currently the country with the largest number of buildings. The United States has the most expensive building stock, but China has the most built up area. Um, it is interesting to note that these 15 countries um, cover 80% of the global value, and we have 209 countries in the exposure model, but 80.6% of the value comes from only these 15 countries. I would like to move now to the vulnerability component. <clears throat> So um, in comparison with 2017, um, uh, we expanded the vulnerability database from 544 functions to 1,201 functions. Um, we have also been applying loss ratios. The consequence model depends if it's a residential building, commercial or industrial. So then you have to multiply these functions by three occupancies. So now we have 3,603 functions. And towards the end of the presentation, I will show you that actually this number is going to increase much more because of the new vulnerability um, methodology. 
Uh, we added also new building classes um, to our model. For example, bamboo houses, uh, previously they were modeled as light frame uh, buildings, but we noticed that the vulnerability is completely different for this type of houses. Also large panel buildings, because some projects with the World Bank, we had the need to um, develop specific functions for these buildings that were built in, the, um, uh, uh, in some countries uh, during the Soviet uh, area. And finally, also one of the reasons by the massive increase on the vulnerability classes is because now we have a higher detail, for example, on unreinforced mastery. Before it was just unreinforced mastery. Now we have five subclasses of unreinforced mastery depending on the type of brick. Um, as I mentioned previously, now we can also assess the losses separately for the structural, non-structural, and then the contents. And we can perform these calculations in OpenQuake separately. And then we can just sum the losses coming from the different components at the end. So we can have, for example, the losses for uh, buildings and then something different, for example, for the contents. And this was something that was um, um, asked as, as something extremely important for us to account. So just to summarize, um, from the exposure, now we have the consequences and the type of vulnerability models we have right now. It allows us to calculate buildings lost, which is the number of buildings which are basically um, incomplete damage. We also have area lost, which is a construction area of these buildings that reach uh, complete damage. We have economic losses using the previously described vulnerability functions. We also have fatalities where we basically convert our fragility functions into vulnerability functions for fatalities. And this is an extremely complex process. And I will present um, more slides about how we, we did this. And, by, and finally, we also took our first steps into trying to estimate um, displaced population. So basically, um, it's the population whose houses, whose residential buildings had extensive or moderate damage. So now they are unsafe for them to, to, to um, uh, return. So we have uh, assumed that this part of the population is going to be displaced or at least um, uh, included in, in temporary housing. So finally, I also wanted to mention, uh, you know, the need for us to repeat the calculations to assess seismic risk because of some of the changes that Marco presented previously. This was one of the slides that I stole from uh, Marco presentation where we can see that um, at first sight, it might look like for certain parts of the world, you know, the changes are quite minimal. So maybe the impact on the seismic risk could be quite minimal. However, I would like to show you here just a, a very brief example. Uh, this is a study that we did recently with Professor John Douglas from the University of uh, Strathclyde uh, in the UK. And we evaluated the impact of five seismic hazard models at a particular location in Switzerland. The reason why there's five seismic hazard models for this location is because there's a nuclear power plant in, in Basin now. And you can see here the distribution of PGA for the 475 years return period. And here we have estimated what would be the distribution of loss ratios for a mastery house. Again, at first sight, you could say, well, it looks pretty much the same. You know, the losses look identical. But if we consider the first model as the benchmark and we estimate how much the hazard differs from this benchmark model, the first model from 2004. If we do the same thing for the risk, we can see that the differences are quite high. So for example, if I look at the PRP um, hazard model from 2013, uh, a decrease of 23% um, for this particular return period caused a decrease on the seismic risk of um, uh, 60%. So th this is just to highlight the need for us to also um, First of all, investigate what is the impact uh, on the risk um, if the seismic hazard um, changes, um, but also to obviously maintain the communication with the hazard team. And this is something that we're quite lucky to basically be able to go back and forward and, and tell them, look, I have this massive change on the risk or the risk decrease. Um, can you help me here to understand if I did a mistake or not? So let's move now to the global seismic risk assessment. So just to make sure that everybody is in the same page, what we do is we grab the mosaic of seismic hazard models that Mark presented previously, and we use an event-based approach. So we start uh, sampling um, many, many, many events. So for each region, we sampled 100,000 years of seismic events. Uh, in this animation, each frame indicates the seismic events that were sampled considering an investigation time of, of one year. You can see that the distribution of the seismic events are around the usual suspects, but it's always quite busy around the ring of fire. For each one of these events, we generate one ground motion field. 
So we use the logic tree um, uh, from the uh, probabilistic seismic hazard model, and we um, generate the uh, we calculate the ground shake at the location of the assets. Uh, where we can consider the spatial correlation in the ground motion residuals, and we also can take into account the interperiod correlation uh, in the between event term of the ground motion models. The ground motion fields so far have been generated for uh, peak run acceleration and also spectral acceleration at 0 0.3, 0 0.6, and 1.0 seconds, because ours, those are the intensity measures which are used by the vulnerability model. So once we have the ground motion fields calculated. OpenQuake checks how much is the ground shaking at the location of the different assets and grabs this previously described five exposure metrics, the number of buildings, dwellings, built up area, replacement costs, and number of occupants. We bring the different vulnerability functions for each asset. And again, for each asset, we're gonna have five different vulnerability functions. And the uncertainty in the vulnerability function is modeled as a beta distribution. And for each loss ratio, we have a coefficient of variation. And finally, we can estimate these five uh, risk metrics, buildings lost, area economic losses, fatalities, and homeless. And I'll be explaining those now on the next slides. So this is the new global seismic um, uh, risk map in terms of um, average annual economic losses. Um, and surprisingly, we see a large concentration of economic losses in West of the United States, Japan, China, and South of Europe, where there is some vulnerability, but obviously this is being mostly driven by the high cost of the building stock. I, want to, I just wanted here to show, um, globally, we have estimated an average general loss of 84 billion uh, US dollars and a global average general loss ratio of 0.029%. Um, these top 15 countries uh, represent 80% of the global losses that you see here. Um, I also wanted to call your attention for the average general loss ratio. So when we normalize the average general losses by the exposed value, I think this is quite important because the losses might not look that high for some smaller countries, like for example, some of the Pacific Islands, but we know that for single events can affect the building stock in the entire country. So it's also quite important for us to consider um, losses for these um, countries. Let's put this in perspective. So how much is 84 billion annually? I, um, we noticed that there's, for all the events, there's always different proposals of how much were the losses and not, not entirely sure that we will ever know exactly how much was the economic loss for the different events. But we noticed that the total loss, um, at least for the event in Turkey, one of the proposals was close to 100 billion. Um, it looked a bit high to me, but it's one of the uh, estimates that we, we found uh, online. Um, it's also about 60% of the losses uh, from the 2008 Sinchuan China uh, earthquake. And there's been some interesting studies about what would be the losses if the Northridge event were to happen today. This happened in 94. Obviously, the costs and the exposure was quite different from the United States. But one of the proposals is that the losses could be close to 155 uh, billion in total losses. So this average general loss is close to 50%, um, 60% um, uh, of what would be a repetition of this event. Now, um, when we develop this exposure model, as I was explaining to you previously, what we do is we try to understand how much does it cost to build an adobe building, mass rebuilding, reinforced concrete? What are the areas? What's the cost per square meter? But do we really believe that if an earthquake happens now and uh, 100,000 buildings are damaged, are the costs going to remain the same? It is hard to believe in that because suddenly we have a, a huge demand for construction and the demand might exceed the capacity. So this phenomenon, we call it the post-law simplification. And um, uh, with the support from Swiss Re, we investigated this effect for different parts of the world. Um, just to give an example, um, um, it has been estimated that the damage caused by the North Ridge earthquake uh, drove their prices up to 20% and almost led to the bankruptcy of um, one of the insurance companies. But uh, basically, this effect that there's not enough construction material and you might not have enough labor, you need to bring to other parts of um, the country. So basically, constructors have the luxury to increase the costs. So what we did first was to build this open database, which is available online. Uh, it's comprised by 68 events, and we collected how much was the reported post-law simplification. And this is extremely complicated because it's not like the governments at the end of the event, they say the post-law simplification was 14%. No, there's a lot of proxies that you have to uh, follow. In addition to that, we collected a lot of information for these events. How much was the total loss? How much was the GDP of the country? 
how much was the maximum MI, the magnitude, all these different variables to understand. Can we find some exploratory variables that can allow us to predict how much is the post-loss amplification? In this perhaps rather complex plot, that's one of the correlation analysis that we did. And we can see that for a lot of the variables, there's no correlation, for example, between post-loss amplification and magnitude. We can have slow mag low magnitude events causing high post-loss amplification, like, for example, the case of Northridge. But we noticed that there is some rather strong correlation between the loss in the region divided by the GDP, basically what exists there. And this is a good measure of the level of destruction that I might have in the region. And also uh, the logarithmic of the return period. Basically, this tells us that for events that happen frequently, uh, the local economy, the local construction sector might have the ability to observe the reconstruction, the recovery. But if you go to very rare events that are not often experienced, then this might be uh, something that cannot be observed uh, by the local construction sector. I'm just including here now a zoom in of these two variables, return period and loss divided by the regional GDP. The return period was estimated from the global model that we have, of course. So this uh, equation is dependent on the global risk model that we have. But we have served that there is um, a lot of uncertainty, but a reasonable correlation. And I just want to show you an application here of, of, of this model uh, applied to Italy. We can see that without the post-loss amplification, uh, we have these losses for different return periods. But if we get closer to very rare return periods, we can see that there's a significant increase on the expected losses because of this expected increase on construction costs. And this naturally also affects the ever general losses, for example, uh, in this case of 18%. The results I'll show previously do not have post-loss amplification because we believe this is something that the user or the risk model needs to decide if they want to consider post-loss amplification or not. But this model is compatible with everything that I presented previously and can be um, used directly. I would like to move now to other risk metrics, something that perhaps um, it's, it's a little bit more equitable. Uh, what we have here is the global seismic risk map in terms of um, number of buildings that were destroyed. So basically, uh, they might not have collapsed, but basically they are damaged beyond repair. So what we have here, we have 365, 9,000 buildings that annually uh, will have uh, complete damage. Again, remember that this is never general loss. I understand that we might have several years where basically we have uh, um, only a few losses, but then eventually we might have these events which exceed uh, this value. And this is the ranking also in terms of um, um, uh, the uh, uh, loss in terms of construction area. I would like to put this once again into perspective. So for example, um, uh, uh, this uh, level of destruction is equivalent to the 1990 uh, 7.4 magnitude Manjil earthquake in Iran. But for other uh, events, like for example, 2015 in Nepal or 2010 in, in Chile, uh, the reports from the government is that this level, a number of buildings um, exceeded uh, what was observed. So we talk now about the area lost, buildings that had complete damage and also economic losses. So what about human impact? Um, I have to tell you that in our experience, it is extremely complex to estimate human losses because in addition to the fact that each building class has its own vulnerability, um, each type of construction is going to be characterized by different collapse rates and then also different fatality rates. For example, I'm just including here this example that the vast majority of the models indicate that concrete buildings tend to have high collapse rates and higher fatality rates, followed by mastery buildings, and then the wooden buildings, which are usually characterized by uh, a specific type of collapse, which are less likely to cause fatalities. So just to explain the process, um, we start from our complete damage fragility function, because the vast majority of the models around the world, they give you complete damage. It's just damage beyond repair. It does not mean that the building has structurally collapsed. So first, we need to understand how many of these buildings actually collapse. And I'm including here, for example, the collapse rates uh, proposed by ASUS, where we can see that concrete buildings and mastery buildings have a higher collapse rate. From the buildings that collapsed, not everybody will die. We know that only a fraction of the building that were trapped inside of these buildings um, uh, will die. And I'm just including here, for example, the fatality rates had, which have been proposed by Professor Robin Spence. And we see that concrete buildings and steel buildings tend to be more fatal. And we also see that the fatality rates tend to increase with the number of stories um, of the building. 
So how do we calibrate this collapse and fatality rates? I could obviously use just some of these values that exist on the literature, but either they're very much tailored to the United States or to some countries where basically um, fatal earthquakes are more frequent. So what we did first was to review these different catalogs of fatal earthquakes that exist out there. So what we have here is, as we go over time, I'm just adding more and more fatalities. You can see the total number of fatalities here on the bottom, total fatalities. Okay. So something that we thought initially was, okay, let's calculate the average annual fatalities using the GEM global fatality model. And then I can compare with the average empirical average general losses. How do I estimate the empirical average general losses? Well, I can simply sum the losses, for example, for a given um, interval of time, and I divide by that number of years, and now I have my empirical average annual losses. So let's see how that works. So I'm starting today, <clears throat> and I'm going back in time. Jill, can, I, can you give me the bottle of water? Sorry. Thank you. So basically what we're doing here is calculating different average general losses if we go back in time. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's not COVID. So, but the question for you is, how much should we go back in time? We have information about fatalities in the 17th century and the 18th century. Should I go back in time into biblical times because I have information about the fatalities? Probably not, because the population that existed in the world were much lower, and also the building stock was completely different. Should I go only 20 years in the past and only consider the fatal events after 2000? Probably also not, because I know that I'm not going to have statistical conversions. I'm not going to have enough events to be confident about the average general losses. Um, so I need to go back in time, consider some of these events, but I need to take into account that uh, in the past, uh, I had much less people in the world. For example, you can see that as I go back in time, the average general loss tends to decrease. This is mostly because in 1950, there were only 2.5 billion people in the world. Today, we have close to 8 billion people. So I can go back in time, but I need to increase uh, the losses based on how much the population increase. Let me just give you here a very simple example. For example, in Morocco, according to the um, uh, 1960, uh, 13,000 people died. And in the meantime, the uh, population of the metro area of Agadir increased tenfold. So if we just assume that the building stock is exactly the same, the exact same earthquake happens, and we have 10 times more people, it is reasonable for us to believe that we would have 10 times more fatalities, okay? So let's just check how much is the average general loss if I go back in time. And I have here the average general losses. Now they are much higher. Before they were close to 10,000 because I'm considering that an event that happened in the 1970s, for example, in Nicaragua, I should increase the losses because nowadays I would have way more people in these regions. But also something that we have to take into account is that we don't build the same as in 1950s, right? We have design regulations in different parts of the world and even the construction practices in, in, in specific regions. So I'm only showing here a few countries, but what we did was to understand um, according to four levels of design regulations, no code, low code, moderate code, and high code, we check when these design regulations were implemented. And then we also try to understand well, if a design regulation exists, but it has not been properly enforced, this doesn't help me much, right? So we also define the level of enforcement for the various countries between, um, you know, these five categories, going from A, fully enforced, to E, not enforced at all. And to do that, um, we used um, a bunch of information from the literature, but also um, a design regulation index proposed by uh, Dr. James Daniel at the global scale. So once we adjust this, fatal earthquakes according to the population and also the um, prevalence of design regulations in the country in the world. This is what we have now. So what we do now, we grab this um, value, the 2000, uh, 22,000 uh, fatalities. We calculate the average general losses for the different countries using the global risk model. Uh, using this initial uh, proposal from the literature, we update this. Um, we calculate the average general losses with the global risk model and this fatality rates. 
we compare with basically what was observed, you know, this, this uh, empirical fatality rates I was mentioning previously. We check that basically what we are producing analytically, empirically, is not matching. And then we go back and we do this repeatedly, iterations after iterations after iterations, until basically what is being generated by the model matches what was observed. So this is the global earthquake risk uh, fatality model. So we can see that, uh, as you can see, some of the most concerning area uh, around the world is the Himalayan belt and the subduction regions in Latin America, and also south um, of Europe, uh, including the Balkans, where we have a higher likelihood of fatalities. Um, this is basically a combination of the seismic hazard uh, with a type of building stock, and also um, the global average number of displaced people. Again, there's much to be improved on this metric, um, but there's obviously a very strong correlation between um, uh, this map and the previous one, because we're talking about uh, damage on the same buildings and also um, the same exposure, which is occupants. Now that I have all these metrics, so this is the top 10 countries per risk metric, and I think it's quite important for us to uh, reflect a little bit on these rankings, because when we say that the risk is high in a given country, you know, what does that mean? Is it that the economic losses are high? Is it the fatality rates are high? Uh, it depends how you go around um, um, uh, your definition of risk. Moreover, as we noticed, for example, in Italy in 2010, where funds are distributed across the different regions proportional to the risk, it's quite important to understand uh, what is that risk, because obviously this can affect the distribution of funding uh, for disaster risk management. For example, this is just an example for Indonesia. We can see that depending on the risk metric, uh, the ranking changes um, um, uh, quite considerably. All this information is being summarized in uh, what we call these country profiles, which have been heavily used uh, and, uh, in, the, in the previous years. So this was quite um, um, uh, nice to see. Um, there's still a few metrics that we have not included in these country profiles because literally some of these maps were produced a couple of days ago. But we look forward to continue um, expanding this um, country profiles and include more and more information. Uh, the country profiles us for a specific type of audience, perhaps not for a technical scientific audience, but more for, um, I would even say sometimes the general public, and we have information about seismic hazard, exposure, and uh, risk and uh, loss ratios. So just to finish, I wanted to also to um, try to get you excited for what's uh, about to come in the future, some future developments. We are already working with Guy Carpenter on this new vulnerability approach. So before we use this uh, simplified approach, which uses the equivalent single degree freedom oscillators, uh, because obviously we have um, uh, more than a thousand building classes in the world. We're moving to something that is a little bit more complex and it's going to allow us to extract what we call engineering demand parameters from the different floors. So I can take not just the deformation of the building, but also the peak floor acceleration from the building. This is extremely important if you think about the functionality of the buildings and also specific damage, for example, the non-structural components and contents, which are affected by the peak floor acceleration, but not necessarily by the deformation of the building. For example, this is just a demonstration for computer equipment that was produced by, um, uh, by Luis, uh, but this is allowing us to expand the vulnerability model to also take into account disruption and business interruption. Um, um, and this is something that we would like very much to include in the future. Something that Catalina is going to talk a lot uh, uh, on the next presentation is that we've been building this massive framework for testing, calibration, and validation, and collecting information for now only from past 100 um, um, events, but we hope to continue increasing this, uh, this database. And this is extremely useful for, um, uh, for testing and, and validation. And this framework that is also going to test our model against uh, future events is being incorporated within uh, one of the European initiatives called Aristotle. Also something that uh, I'm already anticipating some questions because this is something that people always ask me, what about secondary hazards? Where's liquefaction, landslides, tsunami, and fire following? I get you, you know, I, I know that this is, has to be done. Um, we have uh, uh, one of our students is actually exploring how liquefaction can be included for some regional analysis. We also tested some of the uh, models already incorporated in the ShakeMap system. Um, so I think we have a good handle on predicting a yes or no for liquefaction, but there's still much to be done in terms of calculating the, the, the ground deformation, which is something that we really need to understand um, how should be the losses. 
We're currently only covering um, residential, commercial, and um, industrial buildings. So we understand that we have to move to governmental healthcare and education facilities as well. This is something that we're taking the first steps within this latest um, USAID project, uh, firstly applied to Nepal, Bhutan, and El Salvador. And this is just an example for, for example, the Zagreb earthquake, where we can see that uh, despite the fact that residential, industrial, and commercial represent 80% of the losses, there's still 20% for healthcare um, and education. Uh, the current model uh, 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 tackles just direct losses, but I understand that we have also to consider indirect losses. This is something we did, for example, with um, uh, uh, Willis for um, Central Asia in another project by the Asian Development Bank. So some lessons we learned there. We also need to think not just about the current risk, but also about future risk. And Alejandro is going to present about this tomorrow, because again, we know that uh, risk is a moving target and is constantly changing. This new risk metrics, uh, I think we're doing a little bit better in terms of bringing equity to uh, risk assessment, but there's still much to be done in terms of understanding not just how many people will be displaced or will uh, perish, but also who are these people and what are the socioeconomic conditions of those people. I know, Sonia. So, <laughs> so I just want to mention that we need your support to reach a global seismic risk model that covers all current and future facets of earthquake impact. I want to thank, um, uh, first of all, if you allow me, I want to thank, obviously, the risk team, because they've been working tirelessly this, this last I want to say months to make sure that everything was was ready, and you know I can be um, particularly annoying, you know, when I'm stressed. So thank you very much for putting up with me, and obviously also all these uh, institutions and and organizations that have also been very patient with us in these last weeks, because we haven't been as quick as we usually try to be replying to messages, but we'll get there uh, in the following weeks. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vitor. So we'll just take uh, one question in the room before we go to the next presentation. Are there any questions for Vitor? You anticipated many. <laughs> David? Thanks, David Wald, USGS. Vitor, brilliant as usual. Uh, quick question though. Um, when you were updating the fatality model or the overall model to get the empirical uh, annual fatality rate, what were you actually updating? What were you changing in the model? Yeah, uh, it was always the fatality rates and the collapse rates. So we take, for example, the initial proposal from um, Emily So and uh, Robin Spence. Uh, as and, and surprisingly, we went through all this effort of updating, updating the models. And then at the end, when we look, oh, this is not that different from what they were proposing initially. So, um, but we also needed to do that because some of the existing models, for example, they don't give you fatalities or collapse rates for high-rise buildings or for modern buildings or for bamboo, for example. So this was something that we needed to do the calibration process in any case. But what we have now is a set, a consequence model, collapse rates and fatality rates, which are consistent with past observations and is also consistent with this um, global model. Great. Thanks very much, Vitor. So we're uh, a little bit behind, but the teams have done such incredible work on these uh, global models that uh, I wanted to give them a little bit more time. So we've got our next presentation um, is from uh, Catalina Yips. Um, and she is going to, uh, Vitor gave a little bit of an overview, but she's going to be talking about the launch of the earthquake scenarios database. And uh, Catalina is the senior risk engineer with GEM. She has over 15 years experience um, in earthquake engineering and uh, collaborate, has collaborated with um, as a risk scientist with GEM for over a decade. Um, she's been leading major humanitarian projects at GEM and has trained hundreds in the use of OpenQuake. Catalina. Thank you, Sonia. I hope you can see me, you know, <laughs> I feel inside, but okay. I hope you have energy after Vitor and Marcos. <laughs> and today we want to launch the earthquake scenario database. Scenarios are essential in the field of earthquake engineering and disaster risk reduction. 
We have seen the global hazard model, the global risk model, but both Marco and Vitor were saying, we still need to validate, calibrate. When we make scenarios, we could use them, for example, to raise risk awareness, or we can use the results and provide key metrics to governments or city managers to understand, do we have the capacity to cope with such an emergency? Or what is the shelter need? How many people will be displaced? Or how many buildings will be uh, damaged after an event? But when an event happens, like what we saw at the beginning for Turkey, from the scientific perspective, leaving one side, like all the grief and the difficulties that all people go when an event uh, strikes, we wonder, are our models capable of reproduce the losses? What are the weaknesses and the strengths of our models? And what can we learn, what that event is teaching us from the modeling perspective? And at GEM, we have um, undertaken activities on how to validate the models. So back in 2018, during the release of our first global models, we did the exercise of comparing the observed losses. And here is uh, and the plot that shows in the horizontal axis what was observed versus in the vertical axis what is estimated. And the dots, each dot represent a past event, an earthquake. And dots above the dash diagonal line indicate overestimation of losses. And the ones below the line are, sorry, overestimation and the ones below underestimation of losses. But apparently they seem to follow a shape, but we would like to understand why, why our models are different. Why for some of the cases we have one order of magnitude difference. And for that, we need to, consider two things, what was observed and what am I modeling? So let's go first to what it was observed. We need to take consideration from different sources of information. So once a notable earthquake occurs, uh, we can go and find a detailed data. Here are just examples. We don't want to be uh, picky. We couldn't feel like the slide with how many sources of information we have after an event, uh, but we can find specific solutions for the final uh, final poll, uh, reconnaissance report that tells us more information, why buildings were collapsing, what was observed, uh, post-disaster needs assessment reports, or we can also jump into national databases uh, where they can also tell us about the strong motion, uh, damage collection, which is quite useful because it tries to cover the entire impact in the country. Or we can go towards global databases that, in that case, cover a wide range of events, different uh, eras. Uh, examples are the USGS shake maps, uh, Pager CAD, NOAA, MDAT, the inventory uh, from the UN that now is changing or they are updating in order to cope with the Sendai framework. And at them, we have also done some initiatives, for example, the consequence database, because since the inception of GEM, we were aware we need such information, or the Cambridge Earthquake Impact Database. So there is a lot of information that we need to collect and we need to have present when we want to validate our models. And we are aware that as the geographical coverage includes, because we want to check not one earthquake, but we want to check several earthquakes in all over the world, the level of detail decreases uh, as we go global. So in detailed reports, uh, we'll give you more information than the global databases. So we needed to cover, like understand both perspectives because these studies are sometimes done for specific purposes. Perhaps I just want to check global estimates, or I want to develop empirical fragility functions, or I want to understand what is the problems of my buildings due to that event in a given country. So this is one of the things we need to understand what is observed, and we need to collect the data from 
coming from all these very good data sources that we have already available. The second step is we need to estimate the impact. And this morning, uh, Professor Akar was explaining like how can we do it on, from the risk perspective? How do I estimate the impact? But just to give us like to put us all in the same uh, understanding, when I want to replicate an event, I need to take into, co into consideration three input models. And each one of them is as complex as possible. So first we have the ground motion fields. Uh, we want to understand there are recording stations, uh, rupture characterization, ground motion models, side effects. Then we have the exposure and the vulnerability model that I won't explain more because Vitor already gave us one hour talk. <laughs> and the exposure and vulnerability are quite user dependent, right? I can be evaluated in my portfolio or in our case, we are at the national level uh, checking the results. And at least with the use of OpenQuake, we can put those models and estimate loss statistics or damage distribution. So at GEM, we need to do that internally, right? We have a project and we need to evaluate losses uh, or the scenarios for coming from historical events. So we need to validate models. Sometimes after an event, they also ask us, have you modeled that event? Have you modeled Turkey event? How are the losses uh, occurring? And that leads us to, okay, we need to improve the way we are storing, sharing the information uh, to estimate the impact of the earthquake. And thanks to the support from Sura, Last year, we initiated officially uh, the way in which we are storing and compiling the information that we need. So first, we needed to collect information that comes from rupture, from recording stations up to the impact, all the steps. And that includes uh, um, recording stations, ruptures, how to model the ground shaking, and the observed impact. We need to store the modeling alternatives and the observations that we have uh, collected. Uh, it's fundamental that the input file should be like user adjustable because depending on what we want to look at or who is looking at the information, we want to adjust them. And also we want to have the possibility to improve information as new studies come out or new methodologies are derived because as we know, for example, the Turkey Syria event happened uh, in February, but for sure there will be publications appearing in the coming years. And this leads to the generation of the GEM earthquake scenario database. Vitor stole the slide <laughs> in which we are showing right now. We have 100 events. It covered 32 countries. And why do we have those events? So historically, comes from Sura that was sponsoring initially South America. So we're Latin American events. Then in collaboration with the European projects, uh, after the release of the European uh, model in 2020 and all the work they have been doing recently, there are open information already that we could plug and, and try to complete. Uh, we have undergoing projects. So for example, the USAID project called FORCE that we are working in Nepal and Bhutan. So you can see there that we are working there. Uh, also, we have a lot of PhD students that are contributed, and we also include them in the authors because they have done an amazing work. And all of this has been summarized in a repository that we are collecting the information. Now, what we are actually collecting, what can I go and look for? First, let's start with the recording stations. Several uh, studies have demonstrated that considering or conditioning the ground shaking that we model to the observations highly decrease the uncertainty in our modeling. Uh, so, but unfortunately that was not possible in OpenQuake until last year. And precisely the release that we did by the end of the year uh, in which now it's possible to condition the ground shaking to observations following 
the methodology proposed by Engler et al. 2022. And I see here, Kishor Jaisbal also laughing because he said, yes, I know it, he's one of the authors. Uh, thanks to having the implementation in OpenQuake, uh, users can define their own rupture or change it based on, on their preference. We also can select among the vast uh, um, uh, ground motion models available in OpenQuake, or also we can use um, GMIs if we want to include macroseismic data. We can customize the VS30 or the soil conditions. So if we have, if we are working in cities or in areas that have microsonation study, we can also include amplification functions and start like adding all that knowledge that we are collecting. Uh, and we can use different models to condition the residuals or the cross correlation of the intensities. And finally, is user dependent, which are the intensity measure types that we want to use. Vitor was mentioning our fragility functions consider four spectral acceleration periods, but I saw the functions from Professor Akar that were in PGV. So it depends what you use, what is your model, you can personalize. So now in OpenQuake it's possible to, con to, to include the, to condition the, the ground shaking to the stations. And we are collecting the station data that we find in different, for the different events that we have. So some of networks, and I would say this is a unique example, Japan, have a lot of uh, stations available. Uh, as you go back in time, there might be less stations available. If you go to Kobe, for example, you uh, won't see as many as here. And there are uh, countries that have uh, seismic networks more mature than others. And when we are lucky and we have a good sample, the conditioning works quite good. But as we move, and unfortunately, this is not the case in most of the world or in the one that has seismic after regions, the number of stations decrease. And then it becomes actually hard to condition if we only have one station. So when that happens, we can also use macro seismic information to now start completing that, to try to understand is our ground shaking reflecting what has been observed? Because when we want to replicate damage and losses, what is common across all models is that we should be doing the ground shaking as close as possible. And using macro seismic data is very challenging. And tomorrow, uh, David Wald, uh, will tell us more about the new initiative that is coming to have an international macro seismic scale. So in the repository, you can find the recording stations we have been compiling from open sources. If the countries have the recording, the accelerograms, we are extracting also all the intensity measure types that we need, and they are available in the open quick format. Then, uh, the rupture, how we characterize the rupture for that given event. What we are doing is leaving a list of possible rupture solutions we are finding for every event. Um, it's very challenging to find detailed rupture definitions. It's more frequent to, to find a nodal plane solutions or catalogs that give you some values. For those, we are using empirical equations to uh, come up with the geometry. But when we find detailed information, we are trying to include like complex uh, faults or faults with different plane or multiplanar uh, definitions. Then it comes the ground shaking. Um, for the ground shaking or definition of the ground motion fields, uh, we are leaving all the open quake input files that any modeler will need if we want to use the tool. So we are leaving uh, the VS30 right now using the proxies from the USGS, uh, the, the site model at which we are locating, the recording stations in which we can condition our data, uh, the ground motion models that we can use. And for that, it's quite important to highlight that which ground motion model to use is again, another Pandora box because which one should I use? Do I have a model derived for that specific region? Am I lucky enough to have a model for that? 
Or should I use a model that is already indicated in the national model of the country? Or should I use regional models? Uh, currently, we are leaving available the model suggested by the shake maps for the specific tectonic region type that uh, describes the, the event. And the ground motion model uh, logic tree is provided by the GEM mosaic. Once we have all that information, we can generate ground motion fields. But wait a minute, which ground motion fields? You show me five ruptures, two logic trees. We have so much information. So what we left was a uh, sensitivity analysis already run, ground median ground motion fields already available. And what we are exporting also is the bias that we are, uh, for which we are estimating the ground shaking when we condition to the observations. So we, we leave details on what is the calculation. The idea is that anyone should be able to replicate. Do we want to do that event? Here is that information available to, uh, to use it and replicate it. And here we are talking only about ground shaking. So now that we know how to estimate the ground shaking, the last ingredient that we would like to have when we are replicating past events is the impact information with what I'm going to compare. And I'm leaving here in a parenthesis because wait a minute, what is the exposure? Where is the vulnerability? It's user dependent. In our case is the global uh, risk model, exposure and vulnerability, but one can use your portfolio or the model I have developed uh, locally and so on. So for the impact data, uh, we, are leaving information already compiled at different administrative levels. So at national level, because some databases only give us like global values. Some of them give us at the first administrative level, so more granular. And sometimes we are lucky enough to find building by building data. And we have seen over the last years that as more uh, recent earthquakes occur, the community is tending to leave more information available. It's not anymore sitting in the governmental offices, but instead is being shared. So we are compiling the information and leaving the references for you to come and check. So here is the overview of the earthquake scenario database. And we would like to share one example. So because I see already, you are very tired. We can keep talking about scenarios. But we will share an example for the 2017 magnitude 7.1 Puebla earthquake in Mexico. We were lucky and on purpose chose this example because we have recording stations. So we can see the recording stations, the colors indicate the shaking experience by every station. We can use some of the, we, we were complementing data because different databases can provide different information about the recordings. And we were also compiling if we have a specific site conditions for the location of the stations. So the colors give us the peak brown acceleration at the station. And the star represents approximately where is the epicenter. And why approximately? Because it depends which rupture solution you look at will indicate a different epicenter. And perhaps, uh, well, after doing a lot of analysis, in the case of Puebla, um, this doesn't have a very strong impact because we have good recording stations. But if we go to areas where we have less recording stations, the definition of the rupture might change significantly the ground shaking. But wait a minute, this is the ground shaking, not the impact that we want to estimate because it depends where are the, the, the urban centers located with respect to the ruptures that we are defining that we will estimate the impact. So if we look at Puebla, that was one of the most affected uh, cities after the, the earthquake, we see, uh, or Mexico City, that was also heavily affected, we see that the rupture definitions could ch change between 40 and 80 kilometers or 70 to 100. So even without running the ground shaking, we already know we need to be careful with that. And after doing several uh, analyses, actually going through that sensitivity analysis, 
we saw, okay, the solution from Melgar et al. 2018 that incorporates information is in 2018 released, but it was, they actually included the solutions from the USGS and from the Mexican Seismological Center, was actually the one that was uh, providing better uh, estimates or closer to what was observed. And here we compare side to side three median ground motion fields conditioned to the recording stations. Again, using one rupture, the one we saw was uh, providing the closest estimates and three ground motion models taken for subduction in slab in Mexico from the GEM global mosaic. So here we see Abrahamson, Parker et al, and Cano. At the bottom, you can see the maximum PGA. But we know that maximum PGA could change a lot or less, but what is the impact? Uh, we here overlay all the ground shaking so we can see the difference across the ground motion models, once we latin it more or less. And here we have summarized the impact. We are giving the mean value, but we are doing thousand realizations trying to include the, all the aleatory uncertainty uh, coming from, from the, G, the, the ground motion models. And we can see that it changes considerably, right? Which model I choose, I will get one number quite different. So, and the last step will be, okay, so what was observed? At national level, now that I have compiled everything, it's quite clear to see, oh, the total number of fatalities was between 362 and 470. Uh, the destroyed number of buildings, the damaged units, uh, the affected units. And I say buildings, but on purpose I put units. Because when we compare, because the first immediate response will be, okay, those are the observed. Do they are close to my estimates? But we have to go slowly because which damage units are used, they vary across the references. Some will report dwellings, some will report buildings, some others even households. So we are living in the, in the database. What are the units that we are reporting? Because it will be my calculation actually to go and try to understand how they are doing. Another challenge when we compare, and it's not that we are solving, it's just we are acknowledging, is the reported damage states. Are they reporting destroyed? But in our models, we are modeling, for example, a complete damage, but not collapse. Um, and another challenge is the year of the event versus the year of the exposure model. So how do we move ba uh, backwards or forwards is another challenge, and Peter already discussed that. So now we have, Sonia is telling me to stop. <laughs> we have a check at the global values, but when we want to validate our model is, okay, one is the national. What about the subnational level? Do my geographical uh, pattern matches what it was observed? So now we can see what are the number of damaged buildings in Mexico City or in Puebla or in Morelos or in Guerrero? and try to understand where we are behaving. Are we overestimating, underestimating? And some of the results can go even deeper and have building damage level. So for the case of Puebla, we have more than 40,000 buildings and some of them include, for example, year of construction, code level or material. So am I modeling correctly uh, the buildings? Could be the problem is in my exposure. I was assuming that there were more buildings uh, following the code while we observe that they were actually not following, or we can observe the number of stories, perhaps are issues in my exposure model and we can go and review it, or could be the vulnerability. Am I overestimating? I'm actually modeling well those uh, pancake slabs uh, that were collapsing in Mexico City. So these are the kind of analysis that we would like to encourage everyone to do it every time easier and easier so we get uh, better at cal validating our models. And today we are releasing the 2023 first version of this database. There is a long, long way to go and we want to embrace that challenge at GEM because we believe are not only global models, but also scenarios that have to come and play an important role in the overview of earthquake risk. 
There are different factors, for example, completeness. We have just 100 events, uh, but we are aware we need to include events in other regions. Also, there will more events, unfortunately, will continue happening. Uh, also, we would like to include non-damaging events. Right now are like notable events, but what about when the earthquake doesn't generate losses? And are we also capable of reflecting that? From the validation perspective, we need to review more what we have done through calibration in the models, putting a, a loop into creating a global risk model, then calibrating and going back that right now is not in place. So we would like to have that integration and have a continuous validation of our model so we can keep improving as more information is collected. And this is also beyond this scenario database. We, how are we using this information for uh, data-driven prediction using machine learning? We already have uh, projects on that. Infrastructure, post-loss amplification that was already mentioned, secondary effects, and so on. Of course, this cannot be done only by them, and that's why we are opening today. We just made it available uh, before Marco's presentation the earthquake scenario database, a public repository. We are leaving information, but also the codes that we are using to compile all of these, to generate the maps, and hopefully contributing uh, to the community on how to easier, how to access easier like modeling tools, and hoping that sooner rather than later, we will have also the contribution from other modelers uh, to try to improve how we can validate and understand our models for earthquakes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kata. Um, I think just in the interest of time, we'll ask people to catch Kata if they have any questions following. Thank you. Um, all right, sorry. So um, we're going to move into the last event for today which is a panel session. Um, and uh, to moderate the panel session, I'm gonna invite Helen Crowley to come up. Um, and Helen is a seismic risk consultant um, and with uh, GEM in the past and with the EU Center. She has over 20 years experience in earthquake risk uh, and um, pending uh, decisions on Thursday, she is uh, the successor as the secretary general for GEM. Uh, Helen has led the development of the European Earthquake Risk Model, and uh, that was formed part of the global model. So, Helen, I'll turn it over to you, and uh, I apologize on my moderating, but uh, the team has done uh, a lot of very good work, and it's important to showcase that for the foundation for the rest of the conference. Thanks, Sonia. I couldn't agree more. I think I have probably the most difficult job of the day because we're standing between you and the free drinks. Though apparently you're not interested in the free drinks, so that's good. So um, we have now a panel. We'll, we'll, we'll try and shorten it. I think we won't take the original 45 minutes that was planned. But the panel is to discuss the global, the development of the global seismic hazard and risk models, and also the use of these models. So uh, Vita's already putting up my slide, but First, I'm going to ask Vita to join us on the panel. Are you trying to do something? Okay, and Marco, are you going to come and join us as well? Because I think everyone here probably has a lot of questions for Marco and Vita about the global models. So we thought we would give them a chance to answer those questions. I'd also like to invite uh, Professor Han Chan. I don't know Han, yeah, you are, thank you. So um, Han is a professor at the National Center, Central University of Taiwan. He has over 15 years of his experience in earthquake hazard assessment, specifically um, on the Taiwan earthquake model, hazard and risk model. Um, we also have uh, participants that are going to talk about the use of these models. So um, all three of these um, mem are members of the governing board. So we'll, we'll call up Paul, Paul de la Marta. There you are, Paul. Paul is head of catastrophe research at Partnery. His background is in climatology and he has over 20 years of experience in cat modeling. And finally, we have Daniela Di Bucci. Daniela is a geologist by background. She now works at the Italian Department of Civil Protection. She has more than 35 years of experience 
in geology and earthquake hazard modeling, uh, 25 of those working at the Italian Civil Protection. So I think, well, I have the microphone, I have the screen. So I think I was originally going to be a panel member. And so I have prepared this slide, but then um, TC Pan, who was going to moderate the slide is unfortunately not able to join us uh, this week. So um, I'm gonna ask myself the first question that was going to be asked to me. So Helen, tell us about the, uh, your challenges in developing uh, models for the global seismic risk model. So um, I've been involved in the past few years uh, in coordinating the development of this European seismic risk model. Um, we also had the European seismic hazard model that was developed. We have Laurencio here, Laurencio Dancio. Don't know where he is at the back. So if you have any questions specifically about the European seismic hazard model, Laurencio is your man. And so the question that I was going to be asked was the challenges. What were the challenges in developing these models? Um, these models were originally within a European project called CERA. CERA was a project that ran from, I think, 2017 to, to 2020. And, and the project finished, but the models were not ready. So I would say that was the first biggest challenge is that we're, we ran out of funding, we ran out of time. Now, I don't want to blame the hazard modelers for that, but <laughs> obviously we all had the same deadline. The, the, we were all working in two separate work packages in that project to the same deadline. And so we could not obviously complete our risk model if the hazard model wasn't ready. So a challenge in general when working uh, with separate teams of hazard and risk is that I think everyone sees the deadline as the same deadline, but we really do need those hazard models to be ready a lot earlier because we need time to calibrate them to, to do all the types of validation exercises that have been spoken about today. So yeah, I would say that was probably the biggest challenge. I don't know, Mark and Vita, if that's also been a challenge in the development of GEMS global models. Do you want to admit it? <laughs> The challenge is always, I mean, the, the so, and unfortunately, when you work on hazard, you always have a person on the risk side that is telling you to complete the model because they need to start working on it. <laughs> so, that's, so you would prefer just to stop at the hazard model? So no, like, no, no. But I mean, uh, it, it's a well-known problem and I don't have a solution. I, no. Maybe, maybe it would be better to separate the project and have the project on hazard. Yeah. Say, uh, if, say in a nation uh, that is releasing models on a regular basis, uh, you release the model uh, and you release, uh, let's say, hazard and risk every five years. Uh, so you release the hazard and then after two and a half years, uh, you release the risk. Yeah. Not con yeah, the only thing I would say to that is often as we are developing the risk model, we have feedback for the hazard modelers. So I think you may actually change your hazard model sure. as a function of some of the things no, we're finding in the risk I model. I, I don't mean that, that you don't have to work, okay? But uh, I, I mean that it's important to make sure that the, there's some time between uh, the I, release of the hazard and the risk. I agree. And, and obviously, the, also, the hazard models can have different um, purposes. So one of the purposes of this European hazard model was for seismic design actions. So putting that hazard model, and it has actually been accepted as a, an informative annex in Eurocode 8, in the next version of Eurocode 8, so a hazard map and a hazard model being used for design is, is a, potentially a different hazard model than what's needed for, for risk assessment. Mark, you described earlier the stochastic event sets, which might be doubled up when you, uh, when you put together a, a mosaic of hazard models. But um, I would just like to ask actually Han, who has been working on the development of the Taiwan earthquake model. So I understand you followed GEMS framework, uh, so GEMS tools, open source software, and how has, been, how has it been the, the experience for you to, to develop models under GEMS framework? Yeah, I, I just remember I started to have some interaction with GEM guys, with especially with Marco in the beginning with Helen. That, that is uh, more than 10 years ago, starting from 10 years ago. So I, I would like to say uh, to work in this GEM framework or work with GEM framework can be separated into three parts. First part is OpenQuake. That's we we start using OpenQuake because two reasons. One is uh, now a lot of people use uh, OpenQuake. So that means that become our common language, just like English. That, that means we can easily communicate with each other, other modular, no matter they, where they are from. 
then using open quick then we we can easily understand the what's the meaning of each of the parameters and the second is for i myself as a earth scientist i don't know too much about the python i don't know too much about the programming so that means uh, open quick provide us very good opportunity that we can just just use it and someone will organize or to optimize that i can I, I still remember how significant improve of the open quick in the past 10 years. So that is pretty amazing. And the second is I, I have a lot of the uh, exchange in knowledge and the experience with the gem team. So in the early part of this section of, in the Marcos talk, I almost believe that I just gave everything from Taiwan to Jen. But the reality is, I also learn a lot from them. That means uh, we know a lot about the state of the art of approaches, and we also learn a lot from the, the risk team about the exposure database and the fragility curves. That in Taiwan, that we don't know too much about this. This is the second part. And the third part I would like to emphasize is According to this kind of framework, uh, uh, Taiwan know a lot of the friends, friends around the world. For example, uh, around 10 years ago, we initiate this kind of the Taiwan, Japan, and the New Zealand trilateral workshop. That means we every year, we exchange our knowledge based on this kind of the collaboration. Furthermore, since last year, uh, Japan, and uh, especially from need and the Taiwan, uh, uh, in terms of the Taiwan earthquake model, that we initiate one project founded by uh, Japan Taiwan Exchange Association, that we sit down together and uh, try to use this kind of the uh, collaboration mode to build up the seismic hazard assessment for not only Taiwan, but also Ryukyu Island, based on this kind of the kind of the concept. So in summary, I would say uh, we are good if we work alone in Taiwan, but we become better in this kind of the gem framework. Thank you. I think I think that deserves a round. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Han. I think I think it's been a great collaboration. And, and I think there's also many other stories here. I mean, if there's anyone here that also would like to talk about their their collaborations with Jem. This is also a time in this panel. But I think I would like to give the chance that if there are any questions for Marco and Vita, obviously they did very uh, amazing presentations, gave us lots of details about the models. We didn't give them much time to have any questions. Um, I don't know. I know that when Vita finished his presentation, there were still some hands up and they didn't get a chance. Is there anyone here? Yes. Can someone get a microphone here? Yeah, coming through. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Parisa from Munich V. I have a very a big detailed question related to the exposure from VTER because you mentioned that you had some challenges. One example was these combined occupancies, let's say residential and, and commercial industrial together. And I was wondering how do you how do you handle these kind of situations and how do you uh, decide about that? Because we see that there are like three major uh, occupancies uh and yeah <laughs> that was my question how do you how do you uh, handle this chan i think you know when it comes to exposure you know there's never like a rule because it always differs from country to country we, you know uh, for example in portugal we do have information if a residential building has a commercial store on the ground floor which is usually the, the, the typical stuff where, for example, some of the business are in residential buildings. So for some countries, this information is already available. For other countries, it's not available. We know absolutely nothing about, um, you know, if the buildings are commercial or not. Usually what we have is two pieces of information, either the number of businesses that is um, reported by the country or the workforce on the commercial and industrial buildings. And then we convert, you know, that workforce into the expected, let's say, establishments. Uh, for the particular case of, uh, for example, Southeast Asia, where we had to remove um, uh, those commercial buildings that initially we thought existed, and then we came to the conclusion that actually this is in people's homes, we just check how much was the percentage of uh, businesses that were at people's homes, and we remove, you know, that part of the buildings and everything that was left. We assumed that it would be 
uh, you know, com isolated commercial and, and industrial buildings. So we didn't include those in, in residential buildings. But again, you know, sometimes um, we have quite detailed information about this, but it depends a lot on the countries. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Any other questions? I don't I don't know if there's any questions online because I'm I'm struggling to to open up the Zoom. No, no questions online. So I think we can move across, but I need someone to help me here with the slides because we have a, a, a slide from Paul because we're going to move to talking about the use of these models. So um, Paul had a, I don't know how, I don't know how to wet your computer. <laughs> oh, there we go. Thank you. So Paul, I think you're going to tell us a little bit more about how, why, why is the industry investing in the development of these open models and how are you using them? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Helen. Thanks for the opportunity to, um, to speak with you here on this. So I want to give a, an example, a concrete example of where we uh, were very much benefiting from our collaboration with both GEM uh, on the tools and collaboration side, but also working um, yeah, with, the, with the FAIR scientific community. And yeah, it goes without saying unequivocally that um, yeah, the reinsurance industry, insurance industry uh, benefits uh, from, from the collaboration and also, um, you know, to describe where are we at or, you know, have we made a difference? Have we, um, maybe we've made a small difference by, by sponsoring GEM, but it's actually GEM, the scientists, the scientific community, which have a very open um, approach to, to sharing their models and, to, and sharing their science and sharing all the, all the complications with it. I mean, science is not straightforward and um, you need to be willing to explore the, you know, the, the unknown and to, and to put yourself out there and put a number up there. And uh, yeah, we certainly um, are trying to put numbers up there as well. And the numbers that we've been generating from, from the FE um, model, uh, you know, are really helping us make business decisions. So what we did was, um, yeah, we took the FE model. And so just, to, uh, just to note, the FE model is the model I showed before. So FE stands for European Facilities for Earthquake Hazard and Risk. It's a, a, a non-profit non uh partnership consortium of organizations that is ma maintaining and taking forward those European hazard and risk models. So. Thanks for the correction on the pronunciation as well. <laughs> um, so what we actually did was, yeah, we, 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 we took the model and uh, we, we worked with it and we worked with the GEM tools to generate a, a stochastic event set. Um, and this event set is yeah, very comparable in quality uh, and in length and, and, um, and of course, uh, resolution that we need to price insurance and reinsurance uh, contracts. And um, I, I think it's, it's, it, it really goes without saying that it wouldn't be possible to be so efficient in this process uh, without the collaboration, the tools and the scientific openness. So um, with you know, uh, two, roughly two years of um, two, two person years over eight months, we were able to take the model from the scientific community and to put it into operations um, to yeah, start pricing uh, reinsurance contracts uh, at one one at the first of January of of this year, and I think that was a major achievement. But you know the benefits really are um, that we get to implement later science. Um, you know soon after the science scientists have finished their job, um, and uh, I think this is a really important aspect because it allows us to differentiate our view of risk. Um, of course, there, there were challenges, and the challenges really are in making the models applicable to the end user needs. And GEM can't do that alone, and GEM shouldn't be responsible for you know for, for making that next step. And uh, that's certainly some of the things that we we we, we took on. But we, the great thing is because Vito and team and and Marco and team are so interested in what we're doing with the models, we feed back, and that I think is a major benefit as well, right? So we're we're um, yeah, giving that critical feedback. We're seeing where um, we could make a difference or, or not with the analysis that we did. And you know, that's that's the big question. We want to make sure that these these models are fit for purpose, but we don't want to recreate them either. We're not the experts. You know, you collectively are the experts. Uh, but but we're all scientists, so we're not just going to take your word for it. We're going to get in there and get our hands dirty as well. But yeah, certainly in that effort aspect, you need to be conscious of you know, where, where the point is to stop in terms of um, validating the model or accepting the science that's in there. But certainly we, um, we, we feel comfortable with doing the analysis that we did. And uh, yeah, big thank you to the scientific community, Jem and, uh, and everybody else in this room for, for helping us uh, all along. So thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. 
And we look forward to receiving like feedback from you as well, more specifically on, on these models. Yeah. Let's move away maybe from the private sector and towards the public sector. So Daniela, um, Italy has a, a long history of probabilistic seismic hazard modeling. And more recently, there was a national seismic risk model developed, I think, initially 2018. And it's been recently updated. Could you talk a little bit more about how the Department of Civil Protection is using those national hazard and risk models? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, before starting at national level, I would like to say that we are public sponsor of GEM as Italy, because for us, GEM is important, both in terms of uh, background reference, what you do is the state of the art. So for us, it is important to have this reference. And also in terms of uh, the engine, OpenQuake is uh, the tool that we um, ask our scientific partner to use. So this is a reference also in this field. So given this general framework, of course, we use national models, uh, both hazards and, and uh, risk models. Uh, I can give you some examples of what we do with these models. Uh, the, the first example that I give you is the use that we do in we did and we do in seismic classification in building code, because uh, after the 2002 Moody's earthquake, we used uh, uh, the seismic hazard model to update the seismic classification, because the um, the, the ranges in PGA give us uh, the the classification in, in four categories for all the 8,000 uh, municipalities that we have in our country. And then after uh, the 2008, the uh, seismic hazard model entered directly in the new, the new building code. So we didn't use anymore the seismic classification and uh, the design actions are obtained directly from the different maps that compose the other models, so the different return period and so on. And this is the first use. The second example that I will give you uh, deals with the national rescue programs that are a kind of emergency plan that uh, uh, apply to national disasters. So we are at national scale and uh, our disaster where it is not possible at national scale to identify a specific reference scenario. I don't want to discuss with Catalina about this, but when we move at national level, we have to be prepared for an event that can occur in the northern part of Italy or in the southern part of Italy. So we cannot use a single scenario. In that case, we refer to the hazard model to evaluate if the infrastructure that we use in case of emergency uh, will be there or not in case of an event. So for us in this kind of uh, um, plans, uh, the reference is given by the hazard uh, model and uh, not single scenarios. Um, the, the third example that I want to give you is uh, in the prevention field and is the national seismic program uh, prevention plan uh, this is a uh, prevention plan that was established by blow after the l'aquila event in 2009 and uh, uh, the, the law allocated 1 billion euro in seven years for seismic prevention structural and non-structural prevention and now there is a current funding of uh, uh, 50 million year until 2029, let's, we hope that we will go on. This plan deals with, uh, for the structural prevention for the 90% of the fund and 10% of the fund is for non-structural prevention, essentially microzonation, to, 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 to give an example. And uh, regarding hazard, and in this case also risk maps and models, we use them in this program because the distribution of, distribution of funds among the regions was done according to the seismic hazard uh, because there was a threshold in the PGA and the risk. So we use those, those uh, information to, to distribute fundings. And the seismic risk models is also part of our national risk assessment. The national risk assessment is uh, in Europe is uh, something that we have to, at each member state has to provide uh, to the union civil protection mechanism, uh, according to a decision that is a, a European law, which states that the member state shall develop risk assessment at national level or even lower level. 
So we provided uh, uh, the European Sea Protection Mechanism with uh, uh, the national seismic risk in, in 2000, 2018, as you mentioned. Uh, so we provided maps uh, for different level of damage, uh, tables with uh, different losses in terms of uh, uh, direct costs, unusable uh, houses in the long term and the short term, deaths, injured, uh, homeless. And we are working on a to the next release, which will include the probably, hope so, we are working on this, schools, churches, and strategic buildings. And uh, to conclude, we use uh, um, risk models uh, for the citizens' awareness. Uh, we uh, have a, a, a tool that's called, that's called the Securo Pew, uh, Safe Plus, that is a risk communication information system. So it's an interactive web platform where uh, citizens can uh, find the, the, the seismic risk of each municipality, where you live, where you work, where you go at school, and where you can find also simple action that can make you safer. So to conclude, uh, I think that we can say that we use uh, uh, seismic hazard and seismic risk model in prevention, both, both structural and, and non-structural, and in preparedness, both in planning and in self-protection. Amazing. I feel like we should do another round of applause. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, um, Paul, we should have done an applause after you as well, but we'll, we'll do one at the end. <laughs> I, know, I think we're, this was just an amazing example. I think everyone will agree that that's a brilliant list of, uh, of uses and it's an important collaboration between GEM and the Italian Civil Protection Department. Maybe Han, do you have any examples of how the Taiwan earthquake hazard and risk models are actually being used in Taiwan? Are they being used in the design codes, for example? Yeah, maybe as Helen mentioned, uh, I'm from the uh, academic, academia institution, so usually the uh, writing paper is my major KPI. <laughs> but it's an important. Function. Of course, I don't just want to published paper that I'm not quite sure if anyone will read it. <laughs> so alternatively, I, sometimes we are thinking about what is some uh, options that we can uh, apply our models to, to some of the end users. So I just use uh, two examples. One is uh, we have some of the uh, collaboration with uh, governmental agencies that's responsible for seismic hazard mitigations. So that means we, as a scientist, we just build, uh, first identify some of the potential hazard from some active fault according to the disaggregation. So according to the result, and we propose some of the earthquake scenarios to uh, evaluate how large of the ground shaking it could be according to such kind of the scenario. So for this kind of the governmental agencies who obtains a lot of the detail of the exposure database distribution of the population, they can propose, uh, they can quantify the, the some of the potential laws. And according to this kind of the potential laws, they can establish a drill for some of the national national hazard mitigation day. So that means this kind of the drill could help help some of the hazard mitigation agency to evaluate if the, their capacity is affordable for such kind of the scenario. So this is the first kind of the application. And the second kind of the application is to the industrial uh, collaborations. So for example, uh, in Taiwan now, we have a lot of the green energy sites, for example, uh, oh, offshore wind farms and the water reservoirs. So that means we have some of the dialogue with them to, to understand what is the potential hazard or what is what they afraid of. For example, if we are talking about the wind turbine that is very, very long, which has very, very long natural frequency. So that means we need to customize the, our seismic hazard assessment accordingly. A second, a second application is to the semiconductor manufacturers. So 
as we know, they, they not only cares about the strong ground motion, but also very weak ground motion. That means we need to customize such kind of the uh, seismic hazard assessment for such kind of the small shaking with very, very short return period. So such kind of the industrial uh, 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 collaboration, which led us to know we need to customize our seismic hazard assessment for, for such kind of achievement. We need to, to build up this kind of a dialogue to know what is the need of our end user. This is on my comment. Thank you, Han. Some very interesting points there. Now, I'm, I'm looking at John to know if we should maybe wrap up the session soon. Uh, the, 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 uh, the aperitivo is, is, is he's enjoying it. Do you, do you have any comments to add? Or... <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> um, put me on the spot. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, this has been a fantastic session, and I'm I congratulate uh, particularly Marco and Vitor and also Kata for their amazing presentations. Um, for me, it's <laughs> it's it's a culmination of, of of the last five years of work to see all that come together. <clears throat> uh, this afternoon is almost too much. Uh. <laughs> so um, I uh, I just want to thank you for your great work and to have partners um in those who are here and of course we picked our special partners who would only say positive things about you <laughs> and uh so we know we know there are probably some no look all only the supporters came i'm sure so this is a very stacked audience uh but uh it's very nice to hear that that the work that we're doing is actually supporting you in your work in your countries with your uh, in your organizations, and indeed is helping to make um, you know improve our our understanding and application of of models to uh, to risk management to reducing uh, risk on the planet. So that's that's all I'd like to say right now. Thank you, John. <laughs>Thank you. 